I'd like to call to order this committee the whole meeting of the Town of Saugeen Shores and extend a welcome to everyone in the chambers this evening. Uh, the first order of business on the agenda is a declaration of pecuniary interest, and I'll remind every member of your responsibility to do so, and you can do so now or when it arises on the agenda. Nothing, then uh, this evening we have uh, four deputations listed, and the first is Jennifer Wright from the Blue Water Cancer Unit, and I understand she's not here, but I just wonder if there's anyone else from the cancer, cancer unit for the Relay for Life here this evening would like to come forward. None. Well, we'll get to her some other that evening. The next uh, item on the agenda, the next deputation on the agenda is Laurie Lohr. She's here with the 340 Air Cadets, and she's here to present uh, an award. So welcome, Laurie, if you can come to the mic. And um... Mayor Smith, council members. Thank you for having 340 Air Cadets here today. My name is Second Lieutenant Lori Lohr, and I am the training officer with the 340 Griffin Air Cadet Squadron in Port Elgin. I'm here to explain a bit about our program. The Royal Canadian Air Cadets is Canada's best kept secret and amazing youth organization. It's a program for persons ages 12 to 18, administered by a partnership between the Canadian Forces and Air Cadet League of Canada. Together with the Royal Canadian Sea Cadets and the Royal Canadian Army Cadets, it forms the largest federally funded youth program in the country. Cadets are not members of the military and are not obliged to join the Canadian Forces. Extra activities not funded by the Department of, Natural, of National Defense and Air Cadet League are supported by our sponsor, Branch 340 Royal Canadian Legion, and fundraising done by our cadets. We conduct our local training at SDSS and other training at, at uh, as air rifle range, flight simulators, and air crew survival at our trailer called the Griffin, located on Carlisle Street in Southampton. The aim of the cadet program is to develop in youth the attributes of good citizenship and leadership, promote physical fitness, and simulate the interest of the youth in the sea, land, and air activities of the Canadian Forces. The air cadet motto is to learn, to serve, to advance. Select cadets may even earn the chance to represent Canada on the world stage by participating in an international exchange or earn a scholarship to obtain their private pilot's license for gliders and powered aircraft. Other cadets attend summer camps in CFB Borden and Trenton, specializing in leadership, aerospace, aviation, and survival, to name a few. A program that fits in well with our program aim is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. The ward is a non-competitive, self-development program that equips young people with life skills to make a difference to themselves, their community, and the world. The Duke of Edinburgh Award was founded by His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, in 1956 in the United Kingdom, and it was started in Canada in 1963. To encourage personal development and community involvement for young people, participants set and achieve personal goals in five areas, community service, skills, fitness, outdoor adventure, and in addition, the Gold Award has a residential project. About the award, it gives young people aged 14 to 24 an opportunity to experience challenge and an adventure to acquire new skills and make new friends. The Duke of Edinburgh's award began as a program to help young people develop a sense of responsibility to themselves and their communities. It encourages personal discovery, growth, self-reliance, and perseverance in a non-competitive format. Through participation in the program, young people learn responsibility, acquire new skills, and increase their level of fitness, physical fitness. In achieving the goals they set for themselves, participants demonstrate their commitment, motivation, and personal development. There are three award levels, bronze, silver, and gold. Each requires an increasing level of commitment and effort. The bronze usually takes six to 12 months to complete, the silver, 12 to 18 months, and the gold, 18 to 24 months. In Canada, silver awards are presented provincially by either the Lieutenant Governor or the Commissioner. Gold's awards are presented by the National Chairperson, His Excellency, the Governor General of Canada, or a member of the Royal Family, General His Royal Highness Prince Edward, the Earl of Wessex. In a survey, 87% of the participants believe the award had made them more confident. 86% want to continue their volunteering, and 84% want 
felt the skills developed by doing the award will help them to achieve their future goals. We currently have several of our cadets working on their awards, but we also have two cadets that have completed their awards to date in our squadron. Warrant Officer First Class Retired, Haley Lohr, completed her Silver Award last fall and is awaiting her presentation by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. The other award was completed by Sergeant Fallon Lohr, who finished her Bronze Award last summer. For the award, Sergeant Lohr's skills was playing the flute with the 340 Air Cadets last year, and for her physical activity, she did karate twice a week, earning her brown belt. She spent a lot of time volunteering within our Air Cadet Unit with Remembrance Day and Poppy Campaign and assisting with our local legion. Our annual spring cleanup, Lions Club barbecue, and outside the cadets working at the Relay of Life. For her outdoor adventure, she spent two days going down the Saugeen River, staying overnight at the conservation area with no electricity or running water. All the gear had to be carried in the canoes. Although it rained a bit at the start of the trip, and the raccoons really thought they wanted some of their food that was hanging up in the trees, it was an enjoyable trip enjoyed by her and her family. This trip helped prepare her for her Silver Award adventure trip, which is a three-day canoe trip in Algonquin. The most challenging part was the hard paddling on lakes and the downpour of rain the second night. Was it, but the hardest part was being without any connection to the internet while we were there. As she works towards her Silver Award, she continues with her karate, her community service with the cadet unit, and has started a new skill of learning Japanese. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I believe you would like to make a presentation. Yes, thanks very much uh, for that information, Lieutenant Lauren. And I'm going to ask Fallon Lore if she can come forward, please. Fallon, if you might just want to, that's fine, and then we'll get a picture. But uh, what I'm going to, I'm going to show everybody knows what, what I have here is this is uh, the Duke of Edinburgh's award presented to Fallon Lore has achieved the bronze standard. So if you can just come up here, we'll present this. Again, congratulations, Fallon. So, our next deputation then is Greg Smaltz, and he's here about wind turbines. Welcome, Greg. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to come back. I think it's been about a year and a half or so since we spoke here the last time and I must admit I'm feeling a little rusty not having done any public speaking since last fall so you have to excuse me if I get a little nervous no. I did have an opportunity this before I get started to attend three days of court hearings uh, in Flesherton which was the Grey Highlands intervening as a municipality in the, in the residence uh, ERT and I can only say that as these hearings progress and apply a lot of the new scientific information that's coming out, there's a lot of uh, progress uh, being made on the issue of turbines being sited too close to, uh, to where people live. This March 25th, 2015 was the second anniversary of the startup of the CAW now Unifor Industrial Wind Turbine located in our Goebbels Grove Beach neighborhood 
with 117 homes inside the government's 550 meter safety setback zone. The municipality opposed this pre-Green Energy Act application based on its inappropriate location, but lost on appeal at OMB. Consistent with this, the municipality has passed numerous motions, including being an unwilling host to industrial wind turbines. And it passed a cease operation motion based on residents' deputations of adverse health effects and harm to property enjoyment. We had lied to our previous council on August 26, 2013. And I'm pleased to say that several of those folks are in attendance here tonight. This constant reinforcement of the municipality's position is important as the province now looks to community support of new wind projects. Lack of constant activity could be argued by wind developers as non-opposition. In our case, then CW President Ken Lewenza claimed public health was his number one concern and promised both the Deputy Mayor and the President of the Beachers to do everything in his power, including stopping the turbine, should the turbine operation result in bona fide public health concerns. The CW almost also promised to set up a public community turbine committee to monitor ongoing issues. The proposed terms of reference for this committee were rejected by the town twice. The CW mandated that all public submissions to the committee would become the property of the CAW and would not be allowed to be used in a hearing, tribunal, or court of law. This would effectively gag any citizen who came forth to the committee describing annoyance and its symptoms causing adverse health effects. In the two years since the CW turbine was the story of the year in Saugeen Shores, a lot has happened. Over 250 official complaints have been filed with the Minister of the Environment, and we will be receiving these through a Freedom of Information request shortly. Our town does not have access to this information. Scores of residents have filed adverse health effect and property enjoyment complaints and continue to suffer in silence. Badly affected residents have been forced to leave their homes for relief and even sell their homes at a loss to regain their health. But apathy is now the norm as residents see no action to assist them and they have stopped filing complaints. Detailed expert acoustic data has been collected showing the turbine operating out of compliance and emitting cyclical infra and low frequency pressure waves penetrating residents' homes where annoyance symptoms described by Health Canada and the World Health Organization have been diarized by residents. The area near the turbine where close to 700 building lots exist remains slow to develop despite being within walking distance to major shopping and a beautiful beach, both of which are the key ingredients for a successful retirement village. The potential for developing this aging in place opportunity, one of the official plan goals, will remain elusive unless UNIFOR and the municipality initiate ongoing dialogue that is solution driven. One has to ask how retirement living can be developed in Terra and Walkerton and not here. One of the little discussed costs of this turbine is the loss of potential tax revenue from residential development. The other is the devaluation of current properties. MPAC has offered reductions to several owners who have appealed assessments based on the turbine. MPAC even removed the premium water view factor from lakefront homes near the turbine due to a 2012 event. Effectively, this reduced values by approximately 7%. Was this an effort to stave off mass MPAC assessment appeals like Wolf Island? Was the municipality made aware of this assessment reduction factor to waterfront homes? Was it applied all throughout Saugeen Shores and the rest of Ontario? Good questions in tough times when the province is cutting back on revenue to municipalities. Already the loss of assessed value is most likely approaching a million dollars. The loss of tax revenue has the potential to escalate as word spreads from neighbour to neighbour. And Health Canada concludes persons living up to two kilometres away from a turbine may be affected. There are creative potential solutions, but there has to be a municipal will to begin the process. This is our group's ask of this new council. The long-awaited health impact studies have been partially released. Both health studies, Waterloo and Health Canada, said up front they were not designed to prove medical causation. Indeed, this has never been done by the wind industry nor any government worldwide. 
Both studies call for future causation studies that, as in the case of tobacco and asbestos, would likely never happen. Yet both these post-GEA health studies, as well as early and present-day environmental review tribunals, conclude that living up to two kilometers away from a turbine can result in a non-trivial portion of the population experiencing annoyance whose symptoms are sleeplessness, nausea, vertigo, increased blood pressure, headache, and tinnitus. This sensitive sector of the population has been shown through actual exposure testing to be in the 10 to 15 percent range, consistent with those affected by motion sickness. Yet press and industry coverage emphasized that the studies did not find a direct causal link, which as stated, they were never designed to do. Indeed, our testers have taken the best documented U.S. motion sickness study, the Macaulay study, and validated their hypothesis that the similar motion sickness and wind turbine exposure symptoms are caused by atmospheric pressure changes. In the case of motion sickness, typically it's a vertical atmospheric pressure change as the boat in the water, as a boat in water or a wind turbine pressure change is caused by infra and low frequency pressure waves. From testing work done locally, devices have been patented for use in homes, vehicles, and cruise ships that neutralize pressure change and provide symptom relief in enclosed spaces only. Most recently, Canada's leading think tank group, the Canadian Council of Academia, released their review of the Health Canada study as requested by Health Canada. This, council, this council's members have appeared as witnesses for wind turbine developers at ERTs and promoted wind turbines as the group Canadian Association of Doctors in the Environment, a trillium and wind industry funded entity. Despite the built-in bias, their report entitled Assessing the Evidence, Wind Turbine Noise, used the heading Annoyance can be caused by wind turbine noise, a clear adverse health effect. The panel's report stresses that given the nature of the sound produced by wind turbines and the limited quantity of available evidence, the health impacts of wind turbine noise cannot be comprehensively assessed. Therefore, more study is required. For most of the identified symptoms, the CCA says the evidence is inadequate to draw a direct link with wind turbine noise and any health effect on health. The indirect link is obvious. So annoyance with its health study identifies symptoms known all too well to Saugeen Shores residents. It's called a clear adverse health effect by a high profile academic group appointed by Health Canada to review its own study. What more evidence could Unifor, who preach dealing openly and transparently with its members, with our community and with our town council, possibly need before complying with the town's request to cease operations. According to the CCA literature review, no systematic review by independent parties of noise complaints across jurisdictions in Canada has been performed, likely because of the lack of consistency in reporting mechanisms for such complaints or health reports, the collection of complaint information, and whether complaints are even related to health. We're here to say they're wrong. There is a reporting mechanism called the Radiation Emitted Devicing Devices Act, known as RETA. The Health Canada Wind Turbine Study was authorized from this federal act. Under its authority, for purposes of the Radiation Emitted Devices Act, radiation is energy in the form of electromagnetic waves or acoustic waves. Wind turbines emit pulsating, sound pressure waves known as infrasound and low-frequency waves, and thus are governed by this federal law. The RETA is a federal law that predates the Green Energy Act and has authority over wind turbines, according to Health Canada, which states, Health Canada has expertise in measuring noise and assessing the health impacts of noise because of its role in administering the Radiation Emitted Devices Act. As defined under RETA, noise is a form of radiation. The role of RETA is to help Canada legally enforce incident reporting through the mechanisms prescribed therein. For example... If the manufacturer or importer slash operator of a wind turbine becomes aware of complaints of impairment of health, they must forthwith notify the Minister of Health Canada, who can then have these concerns investigated. 
This is the reporting mechanism which should have been complied with for a decade but appears to have been ignored by wind turbine operators and manufacturers. Health Canada must require compliance with this law. We urge the Government of Canada to take action by enforcing their own federal law created to protect Canadians from emissions radiated from wind turbines. So Unifor, as Canada's largest national union with a mission to improve health and safety for all its members, can you openly and transparently demonstrate to the residents and council of Saugeen Shores that you and Entercon, your equipment supplier, have consistently obeyed this law by continuously forwarding all complaints now known to number in excess of 250 to the Minister of Health as required by this federal law? And if not, why not? As I deliver this deputation to you, our elected officials, Unifor is blocking the release of information requested by STOP, compiled and approved for release by the citizen-owned Provincial Independent Electrical System Operator, IESCO. Given that, Unifor, given that the Unifor turbine is legally approved and licensed by the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, and given Unifor openly state they are operating in accordance with all regulations selling power to the public grid, in an open and transparent fashion, then what information about the wind turbine does Unifor not, Unifor not want the public to see? As mentioned, I have attached a link to the Saugeen Shores victim deputations on August the 26th, 13, a short six months after the turbine startup. Please view this the first 54 minutes and decide for yourself as our new council if the municipal follow-through matches the commitment stated to those who came forward to tell of their suffering. And I have enclosed a map showing circles around the turbine up to three kilometers, a distance at which adverse health effects have been documented worldwide. Virtually the entire town of Port Elgin is being subjected to infra and low frequency emissions from the Unifor turbine. And as proven in recent public studies in Canada and around the world, turbine emissions affect the sensitive portion of the population in many ways. So two years later, what are the impacted residents asking our new council for? Essentially what was offered by councillors at the August 26, 2013 council meeting. Help on a situation that is legal but harming residents. Help by engaging an apathetic community who feels resigned. Nothing about this social injustice can be done by the municipality. Help by connecting with the community by notice and website, informing the public the town recognizes the potential for annoyance to be a health hazard, Help by sharing the symptoms while explaining the town can't force the turbine to cease operations. Explain not everyone is affected, much like motion sickness, and it's very important to come forward and report changes to your family's health by filing complaints. Then engage Uniform in a positive, ongoing dialogue that is solution-driven. Share the community feedback on an ongoing basis, presenting the latest science on annoyance, now deemed an adverse health effect by the many studies and the World, or World Health Organization. Our prior council asked Unifor to shut the turbine down as a result of the August 26th 6th citizen deputation. This council can follow through with a substantive effort to initiate a resolution-based dialogue with Unifor, reminding them of their promise and to simply do the right thing. Like Brown County with its infamous wind, Shirley Wind Project, our council could pass a motion based on the Health Canada report and community evidence to declare this and any future turbines as health hazards. Consistent with passing the cease operating motion and as a sign of support for the residents' considerable efforts preparing to address the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change, the town could intervene in this official request to the Ministry. I want to thank you for this opportunity to update our new council on the Unifor Industrial Wind Turbine. And I realize I probably overshot my time slot, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to ask them. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, questions or comments for Greg? Elsa Grace. Yes, uh, thanks. I actually have one follow-up question for Larry. Um, and um, that was uh, with reference to the reduction in the impact assessment uh, for homes near the turbine. Is Did... Is our municipality aware of, of this? Mr. Mayor, I think our finance staff have been doing some research. I'm not sure if we've come to a final conclusion as to what the status is at this point, but uh, we can certainly provide additional information to Council. Okay, 
I think that would be, be helpful. Um, my other question is, um, Greg, I, I assume your group believes that it would be beneficial um, for, from, I guess, the experiences of other municipalities. Um, I think it's important for us as a municipality to be, um, to not be passive about um, understanding um, what the implications are for um, possible new, winter, new turbine projects and uh, to be able to strengthen our ability to have control over whether new projects are, are coming forward. So um, I guess if you would just reiterate, I, I know your list of actions, but um, besides um, interacting with Unifor, what other kinds of actions should our municipality be taking to inform ourselves about all of the implications of new turbine projects? Yeah. I think, that first of all, it's important to understand STOP's position on legal action, because as soon as you mention anything about court, uh, people automatically leap to the conclusion that you're going to end up in a long, drawn-out Perry Mason civil litigation and this is simply not our strategy. We can never afford to do that. So our strategy is to appeal to the director of the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change. And based on our factum of evidence we're putting together, we simply ask her to revoke the operating certificate of the turbine. At that point in the process, like a, much like a, like a statement of claim in court, she gets to respond and you'll be able to see the answers. So, given that that's our strategy, um, it becomes pretty self-evident that if it's not just a group of residents, but if a municipality who has already passed a motion to cease, op to cease operations of a turbine in their neighborhood, uh, the action that we're looking forward to, the town intervening with us in this request to the ministry, becomes very powerful. I mean, it's, it's not just a citizen's resident ag advocacy group anymore. It's the municipality acting further on an action they've already taken. So, uh, and it's consistent with other municipalities in Ontario. And I use Plimpton, Wyoming, and this past week at Gray Highlands, uh, intervening in, in their residence case, the ERT. So, it's not it's not groundbreaking uh, strategy, but it's a very strong one, and it really helps, uh, as you can imagine, the director of the Ministry of the Environment. Uh, I think we'd listen a little bit more closely if, uh, if the municipality was involved. Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for coming here tonight, Greg, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I think it's important to note off the bat the success that STOP has already had in connection and with the Town of Saugeen Shores um, helping out and working along with you. I mean, we, uh, you're the, 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 the public pressure that uh, was brought to bear early on uh, after the turbine started up led to controls on shadow flicker being put in place. Uh, I had shadow flicker in my own house uh, and uh, intervention by, um, by the town and, and by stop uh, helped to put pressure on to get those controls put in place. Uh, the, the controls that were put in place on, uh, on um, operating during cert in certain wind directions at certain times of the day so there have been some successes, and I mean, I just want to, I guess I wanted to state that and, 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 uh, and congratulate STOP and, 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 and you guys for the work that you have done and sticking to that and the doggedness with which you pursued that because I think uh, you've had that success, and, and, and it's good you're back here tonight uh, to, uh, to keep at that. The, uh, uh, we had a report a couple of weeks ago uh, from the CAO with regard to uh, some, uh, the ongoing monitoring that he's doing of the situation across the province with regard to... Uh, industrial wind turbines, looking at, um, as Councillor Gray sort of alluded to, the likely future situation here with more of these things. As you are well aware, uh, we once had a proposal in Saugeen Shores which would, which would have cited an additional 30 of these things in the municipality. Uh, that sort of has gone by the wayside, uh, probably temporarily, uh, but, uh, um, and, that's, what, and, and, and that's, that's the key point, probably temporarily, which is, and we need to, stay on that and make sure that we have whatever we can have, policies um, 
and you know obviously our our powers are significantly truncated by the Green Energy Act, but there are areas where we can act. I had a chance to meet at the Good Roads Conference with uh, folks from Plimpton, Wyoming, and their legal representation, uh, and uh, talk to them about some of the work that they're doing, um, uh, looking at ways for to make sure, first and foremost, that the Green Energy Act regulation is actually enforced. Uh, that some of that, you know, that, that the, the stipulations that the province has put in place itself are actually adhered to, um, which I think is not happening uh, uh, in lots of places. And, uh, and, and they have some good ideas in Plimpton, Wyoming, about how to do that. And also uh, the opportunity to regulate low-frequency noise, which is uh, uh, um, something they're looking at and that those possibilities still exist, uh, at least in theory at this point. Um, so uh, I guess... What I'm saying is, uh, on one hand, the municipality uh, is is continuing to monitor this carefully and monitor activity and developments on this <coughs> front, and I think we stand ready uh, to intervene where we can find a uh, uh, an option or an opportunity that makes sense that could lead to some positive benefits for the for the uh, for the uh, residents of the municipality and. Uh, I think the council has demonstrated that on a number of occasions, uh, uh, where we can find where we can find opportunities that uh, that might lead to some positive uh, outcome. Um, we've been prepared to do that, and I just wanted to make one more comment on an item that came before council last year. This on this point, when Warren Howard came and made, gave his presentation on um, quiet, the quiet nights work that he was doing, uh, and since then uh, Warren is, uh, was not reelected to council, but he's still working behind the scenes. Uh, on, on that front, but the quiet, the whole quiet nights thing, I think, has sort of, I, I think it's effectively dead. I think that that that, uh, at least according to Warren, is is not moving forward, at least in the way they imagined. But Saugeen and Shores uh, uh, budgeted uh, fifteen thousand uh, dollars toward that uh, process, and that money is still on the books. Uh, we haven't uh, spent it; it's still waiting to to do something on this front. Um, so again, I guess that's just to make the point that the municipality stands ready to take action uh, where it can on this front and, uh, and, and has even got some money in the hopper to do something. So, uh, so I think, uh, speaking only for myself, I suppose, uh, that uh, um, uh, you know, I think there's opportunities for us to work together and continue working together on uh, making some progress on this where we can. Yeah, I think continuing is the key word there, Luke, because uh, it goes without saying that uh, our municipality has been supportive. I've been to other municip municipalities where the, we're reviewing the same subject at council, and uh, the vast majority of the, of the council members are leaseholders. So you can only imagine the frustration of the, of the residents in those communities. It's uh, very little headway. So, you know, I, I, I feel good about the research that we're doing. A lot of the, the testing you referred to in Plymouth, Wyoming, is our testers here sharing that information. So we are, without, not mincing any words, we are on the cutting edge of noise and infrasound testing, and linking it to pressure waves and motion sickness, which is a tremendous body of, of health knowledge, and that's the link. You have to be able to link what's happening to people to that. But Health Canada calling it an annoyance and describing the symptoms, a huge step forward. Huge. Thanks, Ray. I think, uh, Councillor Mike Maya has thank a question, you, comment or question. Yep, thank you. Well, thanks for the presentation, Greg, and uh, thank you also, and congratulations for stop to stop for the uh, fine work you have done. I, I, am in agreement with uh, with Councillor Grace, is, uh, and I, I don't think we sh we we should be complacent. And I, I agree. I agree with uh, Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. We have we have done lots, and I think we've 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 demonstrated a lot of support and in terms of dating back to 2003 when we did not support the installation of the uh, of, of the windmill and and and. and uh, our friends at CAW decided to take us to the Ontario Municipal Board. We lost that battle, and hence the the windmill's been installed. And I think, I think, Mr. Mayor, I would be um, I, I'm not I'm not convinced we should allow this presentation to to slide by without without taking some action in terms of of letting know uh, you know get, you know sending the message out to Greg and his group that that we we are continuing to support. Uh, you know, support the, the, the I'm going to call it a fight, a battle, but we're, we're continuing to support uh, from their end. And I'm I just wondering, because uh, there are some specific things in this report that, 
that Greg is asking for. And I just, I, you know, I hesitate to just ignore this this evening and send Greg away with, with no action being taken. And I'm wondering if, uh, through Mr. Mayor to staff, uh, I guess it's around the council table to ask this question, is would it be prudent for us to ask uh, staff to come back, dissect this report, and come back with either a staff report with a recommendation or an options report, perhaps, to take a look at ways that we may be able to continue to support um, what Greg is trying to do, uh, to do with um, the question around windmills. And I'm just, um, I just, hate, I hate to see him leave here this evening without taking a little more, uh, you know, concrete, um, you know, quite deliberate actions with where we may head with this. So that would be my request, I guess, to, to you, Mr. Mayor, to, to staff and the rest of council, that could we come up with some options? We talked about website informing the public the town recognizes potential for annoyance, those kinds of things. So could that come back possibly? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And I think if there's no other questions, I think the, the, the path forward, I, I know, and I want to say one thing too, I know Greg has worked with our staff on this issue for uh, for a long time, and I and I, uh, I thank him for that. And I think, uh, and if council is agreeable, I think I, I, I'm agreeing with what you say, uh, Mike, that we can ask staff to come back with some options about some of the requests that were in here yeah. and some of the steps that we can move forward with to continue, hopefully, okay. some of the pressure or some of the. Uh, um, keep this issue the profile it deserves. Okay, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thanks very much, Greg. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, the next deputation is Jill Taylor. She's from Save Our Saugeen Shores, and she's here about the environmental assessment, the DGR for low and intermediate level waste. Welcome, Jill. Thank you, Mayor Smith and Council. The subject of this presentation is our opposition to the report released last week by the Joint Review Panel on the DGR-1. I wish to emphasize for the record that SOS is not an anti-nuclear group, that we are citizens and homeowners who have a lot invested in this community and are respectful of the businesses and business leaders in our community, including Bruce Power. The JRP report um, is as... Uh, our uh, approach to the GR, or JRP report is as follows. The Joint Review Panel's Environmental Assessment Report on the DGR-1 Radioactive Waste Project was issued on May 6, 2015. It is a document of approximately 450 pages that can be accessed online through the Canadian Environmental Assessment website. Thankfully, the JRP report took issue with the full acceptance of the King Carden site for the DGR and placed almost 100 stringent conditions on its construction and operation, without which the site and project will be judged as unsafe and unacceptable. However, we strongly disagree with the panel that the science be taught behind the DGR siting was adequate, and we do not think the presentations made by OPG were entirely factual. This is an exceptionally important time in the future of our municipality and county because the prospect of OPG building the DGR on Lake Huron, 12 kilometers from our town, would have an irreversible effect on our lives and the lives of our children and their children. The construction of this intensive mining operation would go on for over 100 years and the waste that will be brought to it will come from all over Ontario in quantities not previously revealed to the public as nuclear facilities are across the province are decommissioned, cut up, and brought to the site. We are not a dump. We are an economically thriving, beautiful, and vibrant community whose bright future could be permanently damaged if the DGR is approved. We only have something to lose if this facility is approved and built. There is absolutely nothing to gain, and the loss could be catastrophic. I am here to ask that Council be prepared to take an active interest in its citizens' concern for the potential degradation of our environment, our community, and health. I also request 
that the Council be mindful of their responsibility to be clearly on the side of the health of its people and our community environment, to be questioning of information that is flawed, not to consider acceptance of the OPG project a foregone conclusion, and to recognize that the report includes almost 100 stringent conditions. You must, when you speak of this report, note that this is not an approval of the DGR. It is a report with conditions that are stringent and without which this project will will not be approved. At the last Council meeting, Scott Berry, Manager of Corporate Relations for OPG, addressed Council and gave a presentation that made assumptions that ignored high degrees of risk in the construction and operation of the DGR. Mr. Berry's presentation did not address two years of debate and hearings and the hundreds of questions advanced to OPG about the soundness of their science and process. His presentation indicated that OPG learned nothing from sound opposition to the DGR or their long-term relationships with the councils of Bruce County that had been criticized by the Ombudsman as being illegal. Neither did it acknowledge the profound critique of the DGR by the Great Lakes communities, by 154 municipalities, and our American neighbors. There was very little questioning by our council of Mr. Berry about his presentation, except from Councillor Grace and there was no call for clarification on details of the impact of the proposed DGR on our community. Now is the time for Council to seriously consider what the DGR would do to our community and to respect the views of people who say that it will have a profoundly negative impact on our town. Our SOS community and the amalgamated communities within the Blue Water region remain firm in opposition to the siting of the DGR on the Concarden site next to Lake Huron and will continue to actively express that opposition at all levels of government. In the following part of my presentation, I will note some of the significant concerns that we have regarding the EIS prepared by OPG. We believe that these points have not been adequately addressed by the JRP report or its conditions. The points that I have addressed to you in writing include that, one, the Bruce site is the wrong site. Two, OPG did not demonstrate long-term good performance of the DGR. Three, there was an incorrect presumption of community willingness put forward at the hearing. Four, the DGR will threaten Lake Huron during, due to its proximity to the water. Five, there is mounting risk to our community livelihoods and our property values. Six, there are incorrect assertions that the waste will be safer underground than above. Seven, there is unsuitable geology. Eight, um, there is inaccurate and insubstantial accounting for current and future climatic effects. Nine, that there is an experiment, this is an experimental project and it is not similar to any others that have been built in the world. 10, that project precedents are not reliable. 11, that effect on health and environment is considerably undervalued. And 12, that there will be significant air quality degradation as a result of the DGR construction that will last over 100 years. In order to be brief, I will speak to only a few of these points. Number one, the Bruce site is the wrong site. OPG defied reasonable principles principles of planning when they decided that only the Bruce site would be considered for the construction of a DGR project. They started project planning without knowing if the site was suitable from a geologic standpoint and they still do not know what to expect underground. However, they were well aware before the project started that the site had been identified as highly sensitive. These known sensitivities included that the site is situated within a highly populated area, that there is a First Nations presence nearby, and that the economic stability and our tourism economy is rooted in the safe, picturesque and pristine nature of our environment. They knew that the construction of a DGR was environmentally hypersensitive due to its location on Lake Huron. They knew that Lake Huron was divided by an international boundary and that there was no plan to adequately consult the Americans. They also knew when they doubled the size of the DGR in the last couple of years that the impact of the doubling would bring increasing scrutiny to the nature of the facility because the issues of transport of the decommissioning waste from across the province along our roads and through our towns would be questioned. They were aware that Lake Huron is one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world and that the Great Lakes currently provide drinking water to 40 million people 
They anticipated that there would be criticism of the risk of contamination of water, not only from the nuclear facility as in the past, but now from the DGR. Two, incorrect presumption of community willingness. OPG's presumption of community willingness to accept the DGR, as well as their assertion that the DGR was community-inspired, were revealed to be unsubstantiated at the DGR hearings. The continued assertion by OPG, even last week in Council, that public willingness was achieved in Concordon and surrounding municipalities is false and is the result of a deeply flawed process of scant polling and unlawful meetings of the so-called Community Consultation Advisory Group, where it held secret meetings with the OPG, the NWMO, and the mayors of the Bruce County Councils. Three, the DGR will threaten Lake Huron due to its proximity to water. The DGR design relies on dispersal into the lake of significant quantities of construction water and runoff from the construction and storage areas. The effects of contaminants, including radionuclides, on land, air, groundwater, and the lake were not sufficiently recognized by OPG. OPG asserted that contamination would be limited to a local discharge location at the shore of the lake and that the radionuclide diffusion through the lake water was nothing to worry about. Lack of logic has been demonstrated at many times by OPG, but was dramatically demonstrated on the issue of contamination entering the lake during maximum precipitation events. OPG testified that overflow and unplanned releases from the storm water management pond and the ditches could not be addressed in times of maximum precipitation as the site was too small to allow the enlargement of the storm water management pond and its ditch network. Four, unsuitable geology. The project is entirely experimental. We are well aware that Saugeen Shores was rejected by the NWMO due in part to its unsuitable geology. This was the same argillaceous limestone that will be laterally blasted to create 64 emplacement rooms at the 680 meter level below grade. Under that layer, the composition of the rock is unsuitable for construction of the DGR. Many, many interveners, including professionals and experts in the field, have questioned the suitability of the King Carden geology in the short or long term to accommodate the DGR. International expertise and ongoing DGR construction in Northern Europe point to granite hosts as the most suitable for DGR construction, and the reality is that this design in limestone is entirely experimental. Five, this is an experimental project. It is not similar to any others that have been built in the world, and the project precedents are not reliable. Key among the assurances made during the process of contact with the public was that plans for the DGR were based on models in Europe and the United States that were proven to be successful. In fact, these assurances were false, as has been described in numerous intervener presentations. Underground repositories that were noted by OPG have been found to be defective or not uh, in the same type of geologic formation, of smaller size, or for different types of waste. In addition, and of exceptional significance, the WIP DGR site in New Mexico, after which the OPG DGR was modeled, failed significantly during the hearings with two very, ser very serious accidents that have caused its closure in February of 2014. It is still closed. In a further defensive but not suitable, suitable behavior, in discussions on the failures at WIP, the CNSC and the OPG described poor safety culture as the cause of failure and limited their discussion in a way that tangibly um, represented a, relux a reluctance of the authorities to recognize flaws in their own reasoning and culture. Six, health and environment effects considerably undervalued. Undervaluing short and long-term health effects is one example of many where OPG has failed to account for true degree, a true degree of, say, of adverse significance. There was no accurate reporting from OPG or the County of Bruce Health Department of rates of cancers associated with nuclear hazard to use as a baseline for future prediction, and shockingly, thyroid cancer was not even listed as a potential health risk. There has been no attempt to account for or measure the degree to which the intermediate level waste radioactive hazard, some of which has the same degree of hazard as high level waste, will impact workers or the public within the regional study area or over a period of time greater than one hour. 
Environmental emissions from the predicted decades of construction do not adequately factor in air and water transfer of vast amounts of crushed limestone, bacteria, radon, and other gases during the construction, placement, or trucking periods. In closing, OPG and the Joint Review Panel have vastly undervalued the environmental, health, cultural, and socioeconomics of the DGR and have marginalized the people, property of um, Saugeen Shores, our association with the land, our traditional beliefs, our well-being, and the healthy primary economic base of agriculture and tourism. Save Our Saugeen Shores, in the strongest terms, believes that the OPG justification for citing a DGR for radioactive nuclear waste at the Bruce site is unsupportable, is based on flawed process and logic, has relied on contrived and unlawful means of support, and should be re rejected. We ask Council to act against the acceptance of the DGR-1 in Concordan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. Uh, questions or comments for Ms. Taylor? Councillor Grace. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jill. Um, I um, was able to look through part of the report. I didn't get through all 450-some pages of it. Um, one of the things, though, that I do want to reiterate um, this kind of follows on some of my questions uh, to um, Mr. Barry at our last meeting, um, is that as this project um, moves forward, um, if it is in fact approved by the Minister of the Environment, um, I believe that we as a council um, have a duty to take an active and vigilant role um, in advocating on behalf of our residents' best interests um, regarding the protection of health and the environment um, and, for example, property value protection plan, um, what the status of the hosting agreement will be, and to advocate for uh, our town to be a, a, an active participa participant in um, any kind of agreement going forward. Um, for example, in the report, the Joint Review Panel recommends uh, one of its recommendations, one of its conditions, is revisiting the property value protection plan. And it suggests that it's Im very important for municipalities to collect baseline data to monitor possible stigma. For example, uh, prices of locally produced products, property values, and tourism revenues. Um, and so that would just be one example of something that I hope we will be taking an active role in uh, monitoring and making sure that that's done. Thank you. Councillor Rich. Thank you for your deputation, Jill. I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, <clears throat> OPG says they have public support, and you say they, they don't. Um, what, what would you think would be a good method for which to ascertain whether or not public support is there? I think that the record of the hearings over two years demonstrate the lack of, um, of public support for the, um, uh, for the proposal to cite the DGR in King Carden. There were major flaws uh, that were pointed out in the methodology of consultation, both in the early years in Kincardin and also later on. I understand that, but like, what would you think would be a good process? So I know a lot of people went to the, um, the joint review panel, but I'm just kind of curious what, what you think. Like, would you like to see a referendum on the issue, or what would you say would indicate public support? I think that rather than looking for public support, we should look for public opinion. And I think that that, that could be gained um, by um, uh, a process of more um, diligent um, um, review of people's opinions and an active um, uh, process whereby the people who were uh, opposed or had questions about the DGR were given adequate airtime. 
um, in listening um, maybe six months ago to a report on the street from King Carden on a program that was initiated by CBC. Um, out of, I believe, I may be incorrect on this, half a dozen people who were stopped on the street, more than half of them were no longer in support of the DGR. So I think that the support that was, init that was uh, reflected by reports um, early on in the process, when the DGR was something quite different, that is a quarter of its size, and not for decommissioning waste, um, has to be updated, and people have to be fully aware what this will um, what the, the size, extent, and potential health risks are with this facility. Go ahead. I just want to make a comment, and uh, thanks for the deputation, Jill. I, uh, um, you know, I've been, ever since I got elected to council, in fact, before that, for probably for a decade now, well, yeah, a decade, yeah, it was 2005, um, was, I've been seeing presentations on, on this subject, and of course, um, um, in, the pre, in the last sort of four years, I've, I've looked at it in a great deal of detail. Um, and, uh, but ever since uh, I got elected to council and started to look at this uh, process, um, my uh, view was uh, that uh, I, would, I would support that process and, and watch it through to its conclusion. Uh, and, and then at that point assess um, Soggy Insurers saw the interest of the town of Soggy Insurers uh, based on the conclusion of that, of, of all the work that had to be done and, and see, the, uh, see those outcomes at their conclusion. The process is not, as you've rightly pointed out in your deputation, the process is not done. Uh, we still have to, uh, the JRP findings are not an approval. They're, I mean, now, now the minister has to take a look at uh, what the JRP has done and, and I presume put it through a process inside her own ministry uh, to assess her own, uh, to come to her own view on, uh, on the work that has been done and whether it is, uh, uh, meets a standard that is acceptable to those experts or not. I, of course, am I'm not an expert in that, and the town of Saugeen Shores has no particular expertise uh, in, in any of the fields uh, um, that, uh, or in most of the fields, I suppose, that are, that are under consideration. Uh, so... Um, I think it's important from my perspective, and in response to sort of your your um, call to council or your request of council, I suppose my response is that I um, I'm going to wait to see what the minister has to say about the report. I want to wait to see what the federal government does uh, with the information, and uh, and wait to see uh, all of those hundred uh, requirements that were uh, put on the project to see how OPG and the CNSC respond to that. Um, and as we as we go forward, we're going to get to, uh, and as that process works its, uh, itself out, I think we'll get a clear sense of uh, of uh, whether it's a good project for Soggy and Shores or not. And uh, and, and I think right from the very beginning, when council first passed the resolution before I was on council in 2004 uh, to support the project, uh, I think that was um, with the recognition that. Um, there wasn't enough knowledge at that point to know whether it was a good project or not, and I think uh, I don't think we still have reached that point. Uh, and I, I want to rely on the uh, or wait for the federal government and the experts that they employ to uh, to give us their opinion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. May I respond Thank to you, uh, to Councillor Charbonneau? I think we have another question here. Go ahead, Councillor Grace. Uh, just one uh, clarification with respect, uh, Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Um, there actually was no resolution passed by the town of Sogging Shores in 2004. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, um, Your Worship. Um, Councillor Charbonneau, I, I, I have a comment on, on uh, one thing in particular that you said that you're not an expert. Um, I agree that I am not a scientist and perhaps you are not a scientist either. However, we are expert in reading the information and listening to the information that has been presented to us. And I think that not even a very close reading would um, make everyone in our community very aware of the kind of hazards that are going to present itself should this be approved, including a hundred years of construction with rock waste pilings, 
drilling as in mining. And we heard a very uh, rational and impassioned plea from Greg a few moments ago about the health of our community and the effect that wind turbines could have on um, the, the, uh, the people of Saugeen Shores and directly around them. This project has a far more per pervasive regional and national and international effect that I think if you did read the material and that if you did listen again to the hearings and read some of that material, you too would be an expert and you would have a very strong opinion about what the effect would be on tourism, on our community, and on our health. Okay, no further questions. Thanks very much for deputation, uh, Jill. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, with uh, we have a fairly lengthy agenda, and we have another report that uh, we're going to have on uh, information update from Aqua on our water system. And with leave of council, we would I would say we take that next instead of going through the rest. And we have the people here that will represent it. So we'll go to four point three point one. Read it here. I'll read it off. Well, it is Stuart. You can go ahead, Stuart. You'll do a better job than I will. <laughs> Very briefly, um, Town of Saugeen Shore is currently under contract with the Ontario Clean Water Agency to operate the town's water treatment and distribution system as well as, well as both sewage treatment plants. The current five-year contract was entered into in 2013. This evening, Aqua representatives have come to provide an update on their local operations, the regulatory requirements they work with, and a brief overview of the standard of care legislation. So Ted Smider, the business development manager, will We'll get us started and he'll um, introduce the rest of his uh, colleagues here this evening. Welcome, Ted. Still on. Thank yep. you, Mr. Mayor um, and members of council for allowing this opportunity. Uh, just before I start, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleagues I brought along in case I couldn't answer any questions if there was, but they can help out. Uh, on the far right is uh, Gord Williams, our regional manager. Uh, in the middle here is uh, Richard Laliberte, our Senior Operations Manager uh, for the Hub. And on his left is uh, Andrea Conway, our new Local Operations Manager for the facilities themselves. So, as again, thank you, uh, Mayor Smith and members of Council for this opportunity. Um, first, uh, just in an introduction, just to give an idea of what we'll be talking about tonight, um, is uh, basically our partnership in what we, um, a little bit of agreement information, some staffing, reporting communications. And then I'm gonna give a little bit of an update on the uh, water and wastewater systems operations and a bit on the uh, compliance uh, information. Um, so, uh, a little bit of uh, outline the regulatory framework uh, requirements that uh, we have to work within. And uh, a little bit of, I, I, I believe most of you have all taken standard of care and just a little bit to update on that and, and our role uh, within that. Um, currently, uh, we are in a, uh, the next slide is that currently we're in the full services agreement uh, for five years. It began in January 2014 and we're currently in the second year. Um, it, it covers the Southampton uh, water treatment plant. Um, the Southampton Wastewater Treatment Plant and the Port Elgin Wastewater Treatment Plant, as well as the um, accompanying distribution and collection systems. Um, the Southampton Water Treatment Plant operates under Reg 170, um, which is under the Safe Drinking Water Act, and the wastewater facilities operate under a certificate of approval, um, or as they get amended now, uh, it becomes a, an ECA or environmental compliance approval. Um, within that agreement, there are some... Um, not unique things, but uh, the, the flow-throughs which are um, that are included. One is hydro, um, and, and one is a capital allowance. Um, allows us to do minor work um, within that agreement. We are also the uh, province's emergency responder, um, as sort of all-encompassing within that agreement. Our OR team, or the operational emergency response team. Um, which uh, is, 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 is something that we can access. And just a little bit of information that Saugeen Shores, the town benefited from this service uh, this past winter um, for, for work uh, that was no additional cost to the town. We also have uh, an essential services agreement. Um, our operators are under the OPSU and um, in 
in case of strikes or labor disruptions, um, the facilities will still be operated as normal. We also do offer uh, supplementary services that we, we work within. One is our engineering services, uh, which are expanding to offer various different kind of uh, services, including energy uh, efficiencies, as well as our um, now our conveyance services group, which offer additional services for distribution or collection systems, like smoke testing and things like that. Our, our partnership team, and, and this is uh, where there is one minor little error, that four actually should be a five, actually it should be four and a half, but uh, it's actually five operator mechanics, um, one mechanic operator and one maintenance foreman, and an operations manager that are all allocated uh, to the facilities. But in actual fact, the allocation for Sogging Shores is only um, operator-wise 6.5. Uh, even though there's seven uh, people uh, identified. Uh, the next grouping in the process and compliance, the senior operations manager and myself are grouped as kind of support and are allocated on a much less basis uh, for that. And then there's also hub and corporate support that we rely on, uh, such as uh, our regional office, our uh, corporate support for compliance and, and, and other uh, necessities as required. One of the key parts of our uh, agreement is, is the reporting and the communications. Um, we do um, supply all the regulated water reports, and that includes Section 11 of Reg 170, and that's the annual MOEE, MOECC report, which is basically a description and a summarization of the sampling and testing and incidents, uh, major expenses, that sort of thing. Section 22 of Reg 170 is a summary of the capacity, the flows, and any adverse or failures. We do supply all regulated wastewater reports, which is an annual sewage reports. There's also a quarterly monitoring report, and this is fairly recent under the wastewater effluent systems regulation. And this report uh, is, is for effluent going out, it's volume, uh, total suspended solids, CBOD average um, for, for water uh, going into the, the system. We also provide an additional report, which is a monthly process and compliance report. And this uh, basically deals with maintenance, call-ins, any issues. It's a summary of that um, uh, on a monthly basis. And all these reports are also uh, available, I believe, for your viewing as, 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 as need be. And along with that, as far as communications and meetings, we have a bi-weekly meeting and, uh, and a quarterly meetings. To address any issues, concerns, agreements, problems, and, and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a little summary of the operations, a little bit of interesting information. Uh, in the water system, there was an estimated 1.9 billion liters of potable water treated uh, in 2014. Uh, the aqua operators, we manually collected 3,708 samples, and this is for various parameters, which uh, include testing for microbiological, turbidity, chlorine residual, lead, organic. In addition, the online samples are monitored through the distribution system for chlorine residual and turbidity and logged at two-minute intervals. And these verifications, critical verifications, actually were recorded over 3 million times in, in 2014. The, the water plant is monitored 24-7, either through daily visits uh, or remotely through the SCADA system. Um, schedule and breakdown maintenance work on all plant and distribution equipment associated with the safe operation of the plants was tracked through our preventative maintenance program. And as a result, uh, 1,560 work orders were generated. As well, Aqua provides input to municipal staff for the preparation of the following year's capital plan, and this is uh, this is pretty critical uh, and, and key to ongoing capital work, and it's for maintaining compliant and the safe uh, safe drinking water system. Some compliant highlights of the uh, of, of the water treatment system. It's it's fairly self-explanatory um, in that the water treatment plant uh, there was a uh, drinking water quality management system uh, audit external audit by an external auditor, found that it was 100% conformance to the operational plan. Uh, there was no OFIs or opportunity for improvements and no non-conformances. So basically this means what we say we're going to do, we're actually doing it. 
doesn't mean that that will always be the case, but it is currently at the, at the last audit. The MOECC drinking water inspection report, uh, they had an inspection done in 2014, and this rated the system at 100%, and as a result, that gives a zero risk rating. So that's a good sign. For the wastewater plants, um, there was approximately, in 2014, 2.09 billion litres of um, wastewater treated, a total combined volume. Uh, from that, a total of 5.3 million kilograms of biosolids was land applied to farmers' fields. And again, uh, our, our operators collected a total of 5,958 uh, final and raw wastewater samples, again, for various parameters, including pH, temperature, microbiological, phosphorus, ammonia, metals. As well, the wastewater plants are monitored 24-7 either through daily plant visits or remotely through the SCADA system. And again, scheduled breakdown maintenance at both plants associated with the safe operation were tracked through our maintenance program with a total of 1,798 work orders generated. And as with the wastewater plants, we do provide input to municipal staff for the preparation of the capital plan. Uh, that again is crit critical in maintaining the, the compliant wastewater system. As far as the compliance highlights, um, <clears throat> There was only one facility inspection completed in 2014, and that was at the Southampton uh, Water um, uh, Wastewater or Water Pollution Control Plant or the wastewater facility. Uh, from that, no non-compliance or actions required. Uh, they're not as uh, these inspections are done about every three years. They're not yet quite as detailed as the water uh, inspections, but they will be um, as the wastewater inspectors are now the ones or the water inspectors are now the ones doing the wastewater inspections. A little bit on the regulatory requirements and what we have to work under. Um, <clears throat> for the water side, you have the Safe Drinking Water Act, and there are four regulations uh, under there that that are, are, are important to us. They are the, the Ontario Drinking Water Quality Standards, Reg 169, and that governs the parameters by which we, we do our testing. Reg 170 kind of defines the system. It's the drinking water systems. Uh, Reg 188 governs the licensing of the municipal uh, drinking water systems. And Reg 128 is uh, the certification of the drinking water operators and water quality analysts. Then there's, uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, there's also the Drinking Water Quality Management Standard, which is a DWQMS. And this is a standard by which uh, the operations plans are developed and the operation authorities are accredited. And within that, you, you, you in order to to, to, to produce water, you need a municipal drinking water license. And uh, in order to have that license, there's five requirements. It's the drinking water works permit, the permit to take water, the operational plan, um, which is a framework to develop the town's QEMS or QMS uh, quality management system. Uh, and you, plus you need an accredited operating authority and you have to have a financial plan as well too. And the last thing for the water, which is uh, more recent, is the Clean Water Act and uh, for source protection, Reg 287. And that focuses on preventing uh, contamination and depletion of drinking water sources. And it's part of that, uh, if you took the standard of care, it's part of that multifaceted approach uh, to ensure um, five barriers for, for, for uh, providing safe drinking water. Wastewater, uh, you have the Ontario Re Water Resources Act, which uh, governs the licensing of sewage uh, works operators. Um, there's the Nutrient Management Act, uh, which uh, governs the non-agricultural source material, or NASM plans, and that's the, for land application of your biosolids. There's also more recently uh, the, the, the Fisheries Act, and that's the Wastewater Effluent Systems Regulation. And that uh, governs, uh, when I reference the quarterly reporting, that governs the minimum, minimum effluent quality standards that uh, can be released into the water. As well, there's the uh, Canadian Environmental Protection Act of 1996, and that's um, to covers the, um, to protect the environment, human health, uh, human life and health, and risk associated with tox toxic substances, because we do use a lot of chemicals uh, in our facilities which is one part of it. 
then uh, moving on to the, the um, <clears throat> little bit on the standard of care, uh, basically with responsibilities, um, the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, uh, Section 11, it kind of describes the legal responsibilities of owners and operating authorities of municipal drinking water systems um, in that you're responsible for meeting the drinking water quality standards, um, that uh, your facilities are operated in accordance with the Act, are properly maintained, are staffed and supervised by qualified persons, and they comply with requirements for sampling, monitoring, and testing. Then you have Section 19, which came into effect in 2013, and that identifies the specific legal responsibilities for decision makers uh, with authority over the municipal drinking water system. And it applies to those who have oversee um, the operating authority, and it basically identifies it requires a level of care and diligence and skill that a reasonable, reasonably prudent person would be expect to exercise in a si similar situation. And it's you know requires you to act honesty, competence, and integrity required. Um, and in saying that, uh, basically, what I've outlined is some of the responsibilities as an owner. Um, you you want to make sure you enter in an agreement with an accredited operating authority. Uh, you will need to obtain a drinking water license, and you will also need to prepare a financial plan. As top management, uh, you want to endorse that operational plan for your system. You need to examine the management reviews and audits to ensure that what we say we're do, we're doing. And then, uh, most importantly, as a municipal councillor, you, um, you need to be informed, um, you need to be vigilant, um, ask questions, um, get answers and then make informed decisions. Uh, you don't have to be an expert, but um, you can always get information as you need it. And finally, as, as Aqua, as your, as your partner, um, these outlines some of our responsibilities that we do. Op we operate the facilities in, in accordance with the Act and all applicable laws and regulations. We are an accredited operating authority and we have to become one for each and every water facility that we operate. We do have an established quality and environmental management system or a QEMS. We do have a requirement that we have trained, qualified and all our staff need to be certified. Uh, we meet all the compliance requirements and that is uh, very foremost in our operations. We make recommendations and provide input for long-term capital planning, which we actually have just done recently uh, for a long-term 10-year capital plan. We do provide all regulatory and client reporting, and we do have a comprehensive emergency management program in place, and that's basically to address all type of emergency events, whether it's a blackout, power outage, flood or whatever that's linked to our corporate and I believe is linked to the town's emergency plan as well. And we regularly meet with and communicate with the staff, with the town staff. And uh, this is uh, this is important: the proper communication that we have to go back and forth and key in our operations. And with that, that's that's it. Uh, just the last little bit. I'd like to thank you, but I uh, just like to reiterate that: be informed, ask questions, and get answers uh, is, is key for council. Thanks very much, Ted. Uh, questions, Councillor Dave Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, thanks, Ted, for the presentation. Uh, I, as you pointed out, I am no expert in the water system, but uh, over the past uh, six or so months, I have had a number of opportunities to stop by uh, the different facilities and, uh, and observe people doing work, and, and they do some really good work under this past winter, some very challenging conditions. And they did step up when, uh, when the lines were freezing and all those things, and I commend them for that. Um, I'd just like to ask a question about, um, about those staff, because they do work under some pretty adverse conditions sometimes, and uh, in the 24-7 mode and uh, through all sorts of environmental conditions. Your, your presentation didn't touch anything on uh, the health and safety record that you operate under um, in, a, in a previous life. That was one of the things that uh, is sort of a barometer that uh, an organization can use to judge how well the management systems are working. If you're, if you're keeping your staff, staff safe and not having injuries and, and things like that, then uh, it usually means that you're probably operating the rest of your management systems well. Mm -hmm. Could you just give us a brief comment on uh, how well you're doing with regards to uh, injuries and lost time accidents and that sort of thing? 
I don't know if I'm the best one for answering that question, but I believe that we have, um, it's very good. Well, it is our good, record. actually. Uh, within, our, within our hub, our geographic. Health and safety is a big component, and we have on our boards as other uh, lost time days and I know they get up into I've seen some of them up into the thousands of days where there's no lost time for, for work uh, health and safety yes it is a key component of our operation and very very important uh, within there but I don't think that there's yeah. been any significant in the, in loss the Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you uh, for the presentation. We appreciate you guys coming and, and uh, reminding us of our obligations with regard to the uh, water treatment system. It's an important uh, business. Probably one of the most important things we do uh, uh, is, uh, is look after that water treatment system. My question, though, for you is uh, in recent months, uh, recent weeks, really, it's uh, the question of uh, potential um, catastrophic contamination of the lake uh, partic particularly with regard to fuel storage in this case uh, has become a question raised by source water protection. It's a question that uh, still uh, float. There's now going to be a, some consultation between the municipality and source water protection with regard to whether that really is an issue. And it raised for me the question, uh, and I'm wondering if you can address it for me, about what sort of processes we have in place today uh, at our water treatment plant uh, if if there was some sort of um, contamination in the in the lake, uh, uh, whether it be fuel or or, or what have you, uh, and how do how do you become aware that something like that has occurred, and what sort of action uh, does the uh, does the system operator take, uh, and how quickly uh, does that happen? Uh, can you give me some some inf some information, maybe just on your overall protocols, or or that you do have protocols in place, maybe. Uh, um, and if you can't give me details, maybe you could uh, forward them along. Uh, that would be fine too if it's uh, too complicated a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I, 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 I kind of caught you cold with it, so yeah, I didn't want to. I can give you a brief overview, and I'll, although I may be corrected uh, as we go along. But we do have, I mean, there are um, procedures, there, there are um, systems in place at the water and the wastewater treatments plant for both diesel, the containment um, areas, and, and as well for, uh, for chemicals. And I know should there happen, there's, there's a, 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 a protocol that in place uh, almost immediately. Yeah, much, if I'm good. Uh, it's the MOE Spills Action Center. Yeah, the municipality. And the municipality, yeah. So, it, it might sure. be worthwhile uh, if we could have a copy of the Emergency Management Program or you could, uh, we could see that. Maybe I think that would probably, is it, is it available? Sure. Yep. Yeah, and I think yeah, we can, I'm sure that would probably uh, address it. Yeah, I, I, I sorry, that. sorry, Luke. No, through you, Mr. Mayor, I just I'd, I'd appreciate that, and and uh, um, but I, I guess I'd, I have the answer that I was really looking for is there is a protocol in place, uh, and that and the uh, system operator Aqua is reasonably comfortable that if there were some sort of contamination, not so much in one of your in the in the treatment plant, but but somewhere else on the shore in the in the area that could affect the intake in Lake Huron, that there is that there are procedures in place that you're comfortable with that we could respond in a timely manner. Well, I should say that for us, if there's a if there's an issue within our operating parameters at the plant, if there was, um, say, down near the intake, a, a, a leaky barge or something like that, um, hopefully that whatever took place there would. Uh, would facilitate a, a need for some sort of response because it may not sort of affect us until it gets to the plant. It's, um, you know, in that, in that sense. So um, that's 
But from our point of view, for our facility, for the facilities, uh, there is a plan in place. Further questions or comments? Stuart, have you any, nothing? Well, then thanks very much, Ted, and uh, forget everybody else there. I'd have to go and thank all of your staff for coming this evening. Appreciate uh, it. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. I guess we'll go back now, back to our uh, regular agenda. And so the next thing on the agenda is again, uh, general government report of municipal officers. It's a general government re staff report, and it has to do with the BIA budgets. And our Director of Finance, Kate Allen, will present. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, members of Council. Um, before I get to the report, I just wanted to quickly take a minute to introduce Susan Dent. Um, Susan is my Deputy Treasurer. Most of you know her. And over the course of my maternity leave, which starts on June 5th and ends in early January, Sue will be taking on some of the responsibilities of the Treasurer. So you'll see her at some upcoming meetings and most importantly over the budget period in the later part of the year. So Sue's here just to sort of observe and if you have any questions or comments for her. Otherwise back to the BIA report. This is a housekeeping report. The BIAs both presented their budgets to you earlier this year. Um, this report is for Council to approve those budgets and ultimately the levies will be included in the tax rate bylaw which is scheduled Okay, I, uh, the recommendation is that Council approves the Port Elgin BIA budgets for the year 2015 as follows. Um, I'll, I'm not going to read all those numbers. <laughs> uh, and that the Council approves the Southampton BIA budget for the year 2015 as follows. So, is there any questions or comments? If not, then all in favor. Opposed, if any, that's carried. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is, uh, again, a uh, report of a municipal officer staff report. It has to do with investments, and again, our Director of Finance will present. Great. Thank you very much. Um, as a quick overview, the next three reports are all linked. They all address how we can potentially raise funds to pay for our future plans. There is a lot of information here. However, there is no immediate financial impact to um, each recommendation. The intention of these policies is to, for them to become tools for Council to use at future budget sessions and at budget time as a reference, as well as ultimately to become a foundation for ongoing development of the Asset Management Plan and the Plan. So getting into that, the first one is um, an amended investment policy. The former investment policy, which is attached to this report, was completed in 1999. Since then, there have been several changes to the legislative requirements that municipalities are required to adhere to. Notably, in January 2012, eligible investments were expanded to include several new investment vehicles, including shares issued by a corporation that is incorporated under the laws of Canada or a province of Canada. This expansion of the scope of eligible investments has opened the door to municipalities achieving higher rates of return earned on publicly traded Canadian securities. At this time, the only investments held by the Town of Saugeen Shores include, include our general bank account, as well as a note receivable for, with Westerio Power paying 4.12%, and we own 25% of the common outstanding shares of Westerio Power as well, a private company incorporated under the laws of the province of Ontario. These shares have no fixed maturity dates and as such are not exposed to interest rate risk. They are not publicly traded, so we don't know the market value necessarily, but they do have a book value of just over $4.5 million. And in 2014, we received about $176,000 in demand. All of our cash balances are held in a general bank account with CIBC as per the banking agreement that was entered into when I talk about cash, the cash that we have represents the amount of money that we've collected through taxation and government transfers that has not yet been spent on budgeted expenses. As well, it includes amounts held on deposit. In addition, the balance of all of our reserves, reserve funds, and obligatory reserve funds are held in cash. Interest earned on reserves is currently applied to the operating fund. And as per the banking agreement, I've just shown that our current marginal rate of interest, so on new cash deposits, our balance is over $5 million, so we're earning 
the um, monthly average prime rate less 1.6 percent. Given today's prime rate, that works out to be about 1.25 percent is what we're earning on new cash investment prime rate. That is a very competitive rate to be earning on a short term bank account. Um, it's better than a lot of short term. Despite this competitive rate of return on the general account, staff has recognized that there may be an opportunity to earn higher rates of return if the cash flow requirements are well below the balance of cash that we hold on hand at the end of the year. For instance, the total balance held in cash at the end of 2014 was just over $11.5 million. Of this balance, approximately $9 million relates to the amounts held in reserve balances. While not all reserves are held for longer terms, many are set up as a method for saving for future expenses well into the future. Doing a bit of cash flow analysis, we determined that roughly 4.5 million of that 9 million is determined to not be expended in the next five years, and in many cases, those reserves are going to be held for many years more. So one example of an investment opportunity that is available to the municipality is the One Investment Program. It's uh, managed by, it's, or it's jointly operated by LAS, which is a subsidiary of AMO, and CHUMS, a, subsidi a subsidiary of MFOA, the Municipal Finance Officers Association. All investments offered by one, two municipalities are eligible for municipal investment under the legislation. The one investment program offers several different investment vehicles and they're meant to achieve all objectives. There's a money market fund, a couple different bond funds, and then the Canadian equity fund is geared towards investments of that longer time horizon. So to give you an idea of the additional earnings potential that we could tap into, um, I've done a sort of just a little summary table looking at if we had invested $2.5 million dollars Ten or five years ago, um, and that represents about half of what we've determined is that outstanding cash that we're not using in the short term. We, we held it in our general bank account, so the actual investment income that we earned in five years on that $2.5 million was $175,000. Had we invested it in the Canadian Equities Fund through um, the one program, we would have earned $1.8 million. The difference there is about 1.7, just under 1.7 million dollars. Now I chose this fund because it is the most dramatic. Um, obviously, it's also the most risky. As you've got more risk, you get higher rates of return. But this is for demonstration purposes, and um, also you can't necessarily rely on historical returns to pay off your loan. So, as noted in the recommendation of the reserves report, also presented in tonight's. Staff would like to revisit the way in which investment income is allocated to long-term capital reserves. If income is able to be held within the fund and compound combined with the opportunity to invest in various investment vehicles longer than one year, the impact to the town's overall ability to save could be significant. Should Council like more information, we would arrange to have a presentation from, one, from the ONE program or any other financial institution to provide more details on the opportunities that are available. So the financial impact of this in amending the current existing policy, that there is no immediate financial impact um, by going with the recommendation. However, we would like to see more information on the prior. Thank you, Kate. Then uh, there's a recommendation that, it's that Council adopts the amended investment management policy. Questions? Comments? Start here. Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just in response to sort of the query that uh, Kate puts at the end of the report with regard to Council's interest in more information from one, I think that we would be interested in more information, not just from, or I would be interested in seeing that information from one, uh, because, uh, and, and other information on other investment vehicles, I think, uh, I mean, the the, uh, the figures you put there are tempting uh, and, and interesting if you put them Back to 2007, that 11 percent would come down fairly significantly over that time. I think you know, it, it, the stock taking a snapshot of the stock market in time is always a little bit risky. But, but I think that I think there's no doubt what you've demonstrated here is that there's opportunities to do better than what we have been doing. And council has always been, I think, very conservative 
with the public's money, and rightfully so, justifiably so, and I think I and I don't think I would be comfortable dealing with these accounts the same way I might invest for myself, because I because you know so many people are are impacted, and it's important that we protect the the principal and what growth we can in these accounts. So, you know, I'm not sure I'm entirely sold on on equity funds for the municipality's reserves, but. Uh, but I think there are better. I think there may be better options than just a bank account, uh, and I think you've demonstrated that, and I really appreciate it. And uh, and I would be interested in in hearing, like I say, from one, but also perhaps a, a broader array of potential options that we might have to do better than than uh, than what we're doing right now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Vice Deputy Huber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kate, you you mentioned uh, very quickly, and it, and it's in your report that the current policy is that uh, interest income goes towards operating. Um, I thought we were um, hopefully going to have a discussion about um, a potential um, change in that so that the interest coming off um, some of the uh, reserve funds could actually be applicable towards what that reserve fund is supposed to be all about. Does this amendment to the investment policy provide that opportunity or is it assuming that that still any any interest income is just automatically transferred towards operating expenses Your your worship the investment policy itself really just deals with how we invest um, the authority to invest and what we can invest in what you're talking about is how how that income gets allocated is actually addressed in my next report which is how they're all linked other in the actual reserves we have in place, which reserves maybe are able to pay through that interest, whereas other reserves will continue to pay that interest. That is coming partly from the investment policy. Councillor Grace. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I too would like to see a presentation by um, one investment. I did see a very brief one at the presentation that they did in Walkerton uh, maybe a month ago, but. Um, I think it'd be great for us to see that and, and any others that you can arrange that you think would be beneficial. Thank you. Councillor Rich. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also would like to see additional information, but I think it's worth noting that if we get 1.2% interest and inflation's at two, that it's actually the $175,000 is not a, a gain, but a loss over inflation for the value of that money. And I, and I think that's something we have to keep taking into consideration as we think about it too. Councillor Mike Myatt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had the opportunity to uh, to attend. I'll be supporting this recommendation. I uh, I, I think it's got, got may, has a lot of merit. And uh, I attended a session at the OSM conference a week and a half ago. And uh, I purposely attended the session with CIBC on municipal financial financial investing. And uh, they talk about. They talk about deposit notes and equity funds and, and most interesting session. And the reason I went was, uh, well, several reasons, but one of the main ones being I don't, I don't particularly like the 1.25% interest rate that we're, we're receiving on our investments. And um, I'm not as nervous about investing in, in, in a deposit note, for example, as, as, as some may be. I, I, I talked to uh, CIBC officials afterwards, and part of the presentation, Here's an interesting stat. Um, over a 20-year period, um, investing in the kinds of funds that CIBC would make a presentation to this council on, I'd like to hear CIBC make a presentation uh, in addition to the one program. But um, over a 20-year period, they showed an annual rate of return of 8.9%. And uh, so, yeah, you take into consideration the two, 2008 uh, crash, but over a 20-year period, 8.9% sounds really, really good to me. And the important thing is here to remember is that with, with their investment portfolio, we could develop with an agent, with someone like CIBC or the, or the one program. Um, you know, it's, 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 the capital is 100% protected. And you won't get that with, with, with all investment firms. So I think the message, you know, I, you know, I, I hope you'll be able to pass on to council is that we can do a whole lot better than 1.25 percent, and my second message is: I think that we need to hear from CIBC, is who we our investment, our, our financial firm is with, it's where we do our banking. And I would like to see the two presentations um, side by side. Maybe a, 
whether it's one to four in the afternoon or six to nine at night or a Saturday morning, but but bring those two groups in to talk about um, investing, Mr. Mayor, and, and see if we can't do a whole lot better. So I, I, I wholeheartedly support this recommendation and uh, I think we can uh, do a lot more, a lot better on it with our investments. Thank you. Other comment? Deputy Mayor, go ahead. I wanted to make one more comment that I wanted to make and forgot, and that is with, you know, with regard to the municipal reserves, while the, while the return is low compared to the stock market, the, um, the reserves are, need to be a flexible tool that the municipality can access at any moment to, to fund anything. So yes, you can get, a, you can get an 8%, 11% rate of return over a period of years, and when you aggregate that out over the extension of the time, it looks great. But in the year 2008, if you'd needed to do something with the reserves, you would have been out of luck. Or you would, or worse, or worse, you would have been selling at the bottom of the market, which would have been bad. It would be a major loss for the for the for the taxpayer. So, so I think it's. I mean, we have to be very careful as we look at these things, and we have to think about these presentations in terms of the needs of the municipality and what it needs to do with its reserves. And I, so I think that um, I think it's just critical that. Uh, we be very cautious with 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 the reserves as we go forward. Hear these presentations, but 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 uh, I just want. I guess the reason why I make that statement is only because um, I think there's good justification for the approach uh, that the municipality has taken with its reserve funds up to this date. Whether or not we want to change that in the future because of new information is is uh, is up to us and something we should consider. But it's but I think there's been good justification for it and uh, and. Um, and it has led to it put us in a strong position up to this date. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks. I think uh, yeah, I, I agree with a number of the things, but I think that's the next step. We're just getting the policy, and we're going to well, if 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 we just started to look at options, then there'll be I'm sure a big discussion on that too. If there's no further questions with regard to, the, did you have a question? No. For, with regard to this recommendation and policy, then I'll ask the question. All in favor. Opposed, if any, that's carried. So there's an, one another report. It has to do with investments. Oh, sorry, reserves and rever, reserve funds. And again, Kate will present. Thank you again. So as I said before, this sort of builds on the report that I just. Reserve funds do play a very important role in the town's finances and provide a strong indicator of our overall health. The town has utilized reserves as a vehicle for setting aside and earmarking funds since its inception. However, we have not had a formal policy adopted by resolution to govern the administration of this balance. There is a benefit to having a single policy to ensure consistent framework and a central reference document. The policy is intended to assist in the administration of reserves, reserve funds and obligatory reserve funds, and establish consistent guidelines and standards. The new policy that's attached to this report has two sections. There's the policy section with an overview and guidance on the principles that apply to each classification of reserves, included, including how reserves are established, contributions and transfers and interest. The second section, entitled Appendix to Reserve Policy, provides more detailed guidance specific to the individual reserve classification. So the following summarizes the different types of reserves, their balances as included. These classifications are the town's classifications. These are sort of how we use the reserves, whereas the, the titles as given in the policy, reserves, reserve funds, obligatory reserve funds, those refer more to how the reserve is or statements and how interest is So the stabilization reserves, these represent reserves that are used to offset extraordinary and unforeseen operating expenditure requirements one-time expenditures and revenue shortfalls, and they're meant to minimize those peaks and valleys in your operating budget. Um, this, this report discusses that the tax rate stabilization reserve here, it does have a goal of keeping it at 2% of the current year tax levy. Other examples include the election reserve that we make a constant contribution to to make sure that the election reserve is not cut at, at tax rate expenses, and the winter control reserve. Corporate reserves are for corporate uses and are established to provide for various contingent and potential future liabilities. Currently, we have two corporate reserves, the insurance and the Capital and infrastructure renewal reserves. These reserves are used to fund specific procurement, replacement, and renewal of capital assets. 
As the assets of the town increase, so should the contribution from the operating budget to these reserves. Optimal reserve balances will be tied into the asset management plan in the future as the financing strategy is evaluated and documented. By making consistent, stable contributions to these reserves and then using the reserves to fund in infrastructure projects, Council can even out spending that is done on an annual basis on mainline rail projects. As staff work towards implementing a life cycle costing system, the composition, balance, and targets for the capital reserves will be evaluated. And these reserves are typically your longer term reserves, and there's, these are where most of your um, interest earning dividend funds are located. Then we get to the program specific reserves. These reserves have been established and maintained for fund-specific programs or for specific funding that has been received. These funds are generally used for capital or operating. They're generally shorter term in nature and not interest-bearing. Rate-funded reserves are reserves funded through user fees or revenue-neutral departments. Um, there are three here, the water, wastewater, and land. And then we have our developer de reserves. These reserves hold um, direct developer contributions towards future capitals tied to the developments. While there's no obligation to return these funds should work not be performed, they continue to be earmarked for their designated Financial impact of this report. Prior to the adoption of the reserve fund policy as it has been presented with this report, all income on earned on reserves Cash balances has been budgeted and recorded in the operating fund in the year that they have been received. The recommendation of accruing interest back to the reserve funds will introduce revenues, will reduce revenues in the operating fund. The estimated future balance of these funds at December 31st, 2015 is approximately $6,000. Assuming no change in the year, the income earned in 2016 would be approximately However, this is not lost revenue, it is deferring revenue. Combined with opportunities to invest, identified in the investment report preceding this one, allowing reserve funds to accumulate investment income, we can benefit from the compounding of earning income on income. We can identify our cash flow needs and we can invest surplus funds over longer term. So attached then we just have the tables that have your estimated reserve balances and then we get into the policy itself, describing the difference between a reserve, a reserve fund, and an obligatory reserve fund. And then each reserve that we have is actually noted there. And we've noted when it was established, what the purpose of the funds are, where the original funding or ongoing funding is coming from, whether or not it be interest accruing, and which manager sort of has oversight of that reserve. Thank you, Kate. Uh, the recommendation is that Council adopts the reserves and reserves fund policy uh, that the reserve funds identified as interest bearing have interest accrued on, bal on the balance of a cash effective January the 1st, 2016. Uh, uh, Vice Deputy Huber. Thank you. Um, I agree um, completely with the idea behind the report and, and the, the end expectation from, from what you're suggesting. What I don't agree with and um, I, I would ask that perhaps it be isolated out or that we defer um, the vote until you know, a little more information is possible. I don't like the listing of the reserve funds because some of the descriptions are very different than what I've been um, understanding during two terms of council. So I'm not convinced that um, uh, I can accept um, some of the descriptions that are there. Um, because there's items now on the list that have never been discussed before. And as one example, I'll just very specifically highlight out, Parkland Reserve um, has always been described to me um, in various ways I've asked the question that it's for park land. Um, there seems to be new language there with, associated with the reserve that um, I, I'm not sure where that's come from. So um, I would respectfully ask that... Um, that part of the report um, be perhaps set aside so that we can all digest it and ask questions about um, what, what, uh, how reserve funds were created and what they're spo supposedly intended for, um, aside from the idea behind this particular report, which I agree with. But I just, I can't 
um, accept the report having questions about some of the definitions of reserve funds because um, I, I find it a little questioning that in three terms of council I, I didn't understand something um, based on what, what's being put on paper before us now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, I guess we'll take, maybe we should try and deal with this now. Um, so is there a specific fund, uh, Diane, that you, or Vice Deputy Mayor Huber? Is there one specifically? I think... Well, I, I very so we, so we can clear it up. Maybe we can clear it up tonight. Well, I've I've I very specifically mentioned parkland. I just okay. find, um, you know, I'm it's my third term on council. There's there's a lot of people sitting at the table that it's their first term, and we have three big financial documents um, in front of us tonight. That um, the ideas behind them are all sound. They're all good, um, and and it's definitely um, a direction that that I can agree with. I just think that um, reserve funds, um, I would, would welcome the opportunity to have a little bit more time to um, take a look at the list and, and um, question, challenge um, some of the definitions that are there now. Parkland Reserve is the one that jumped out at me initially, but um, you know, even the, the one about the Southampton Library, um, it originally was set up very specific from a donation that it had something to do with the actual building, and you know, now there, there's language that it's it's about future activity at the library. Um, could be the same thing, could be something different. So I, I guess you know, I, I'm just I'm thinking that that there's an awful lot of um, good stuff here and that we if we could isolate out the list of reserve funds and perhaps consider um, at the next meeting or two meetings down the road that actual appendix um, that has all of that information so that then there would be time to ask questions of individual funds. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Sherman. Thank you Mr. Mayor and I, I guess uh, first I'll just say Kate that I think this is a really a uh, great report and really clarifies a lot about how the reserves, uh, how they fit and how they're managed and what they do. And I want to thank you for the report. Um, so that's a caveat for what I'm about to say, which is that there's a, there's one thing about it, uh, which for me is going to have to change before I can support uh, the document. And that is with regard to the treatment of the police reserves, um, particularly uh, they're they're highlighted in the appendix. At, uh, they're in the appendix at 1,000 and 1,010, the police reserve and the police canine reserve, and they're treated as reserves. And so my understanding is because of their title that uh, the new policy puts them their existence entirely at the discretion of the treasurer um, and that they can be eliminated by the treasurer and and the only requirement therefore, uh, thereafter is for the treasurer to inform council that it has been eliminated. And in my view, uh, the police reserves, uh, particularly those two, the police building reserve, I think, is a different animal in that it has to do its money set aside by council to fund um, a building that it owns and doesn't have anything to do with the police services board. But in terms of the uh, uh, the two other reserves, the canine reserve and the other police reserve, I think those are operating reserves of the police service, and therefore um, they should they should. Um, the police services board should have discretion over whether or not they exist uh, and uh, whether they can be removed. So, I, so uh, it's a small thing, I think, uh, but, uh, but I need to see that changed before I could uh, uh, vote in favour of the whole package. Have you got a comment? Mm -hmm. Kate? Certainly. To be clear, um, the treasurer, although is given the authority to create a reserve, the treasurer does not have the authority to transfer funds so if a reserve were to remain empty for a period of time, the treasurer does have authorities to receive. That being said, all transfers to and from reserves, reserve funds, and obligatory reserve funds must be approved by council, either by budget or by motion. And that is something that the auditors look at at the end of the year. So I wouldn't say the treasurer has any authority. You're right. Is order in order to create a new reserve or name a reserve, that we allow the uh, treasurer the authority over reserves. Well, look, Mr. Mayor, I, I guess I'm a little confused then, Kate, because I mean, because the the policy language is fairly clear under reserves authority to establish if the purpose or purpose 
purposes for the reserve have been accomplished or if the reserve is no longer necessary, the Director of Finance has the authority to close the reserve and report the change to Council at any time throughout the year. It doesn't dictate that the reserve has to be empty and it doesn't say, uh, well, of course, the, the transfer out ha is, in, is carried on in the next paragraph, but, but my trouble, my, my view is that, that those reserves, like, I mean, there are, those reserves should be, there should be some, there should be a, another um, category of reserves that are reserves held entirely by municipal boards uh, and that those, and that the boards, uh, whatever they are, whether it be a BIA or um, a police board, those are the only two I can think of off the top of my head, but there are others, other examples, uh, that, that those, that the municipality owns and manage, or manages them, but the authority to close the reserve um, uh, I'm uncomfortable with, with the, I'm frankly uncomfortable with the role of the Director of Finance, but also the, uh, the, the role of, of Council even to close the reserve, a, a police operating reserve unilaterally. I think that there has to be a role for the Police Services Board because they're, they're operating, they're operating reserves of the Police Services Board. Um, as my view um, with regard to uh, the authority of the Police Services Board. The CAOs have a comment, then we'll get to you, Kate. Um, it, you have like the detail that that goes with it where it, it does indicate for the police ones that the police services board does in fact manage them so so that's in the detail that follows the, the policy and the detailed description for each reserve and also to be consistent um, I did exclude the BIA reserves as a separate board from this policy. So if it be Council's direction to remove those police board reserves from the umbrella of this reserve policy, we could certainly do that as well. Yeah, I, I have no trouble with that. I do have a, a little trouble about, I mean, ultimately it is this body council that raises the money for those reserves. And I think, so the ultimate authority about how those reserves are dealt with, um, I think Council's got to be has some say in it also. We raise it through the taxes. We set the taxes each year. We approve or don't approve the budget. I agree with it, but so I, I'm not gonna, I, like, I don't think we need to get into a big discussion on it and, and worry about that issue, but I think we can deal with it. If you wish to take them out, take them out. It's not a big deal with me. Okay, then I guess the, the other question, the other item I think that was kind of, we, we we were having some trouble with was the naming, I guess, in the description of the reserves, which is in Appendix A of this, this the policy, right? And I wonder, I mean, uh, for, for, for uh, to try and get to some resolution of this, I, I, if we can adopt this with the exception of the, the two things, and we'll have the discussion about the, the description in, in Appendix A at some other time to deal with Vice Deputy Mayor Huber's comments and, and uh, the Deputy Mayor's with the police. Is that acceptable to the to to committee? So that's the understanding, and I don't think we need an amendment, right? and unless you want an amendment to it. I think well, understanding is this is just a recommendation. That's how we'll move forward with it. Go ahead. I may note as well the actual policy itself refers to the appendix, but we would update the appendix on an annual basis as reserves change. We'll have new reserves every year. Reserves will close down, so certainly we can accept the recommendation and still amend the appendix to make sure that the wording agrees. And I understand um, I was sort of lacking a reserve policy in the past, sort of trying to find all this information and consolidate it from a variety of sources. So there are certainly more history on council knowledge than perhaps I was able to find and, and definitely there's open for comments for council that appendix. Okay, I have one other comment. It's interesting. We just had the financial statements presented at Bruce County, and and they are progressing with, a, uh, as I've sat here a number of years and seen them, how they we used to look at them, and they were pretty simple documents about 15 years ago. Now how we include uh, capital assets and amortization and uh, a, a replacement costs of these assets, it is a wealth of information. And I, this particular policy, I think, will give councils in the future a great deal of information about whether you're adequately addressing your, your capital assets through your capital and infrastructure renewal 
reserve because if you're meeting those amortization costs, if you're budgeting enough and spending enough for amortization of those existing capital assets, or you're not, you will know. And I think it's a powerful tool for councils about how you plan for the future with your existing capital assets and acquiring new ones. Anyways, that was my little rant. <laughs> so, it, okay, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to throw out a compliment to uh, Kate for uh, two, two um, excellent reports. And, uh, you know, I think any time we could take, uh, you know, accruing interest and in, in, in credit back to our reserves and com start compounding interest rather than that risk the temptation taking that $84,000 every year to lower the tax revenue. It's just good, makes good business sense. And I just want to get that out there. Of course, they're very well done. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, and uh, just in follow-up to what Councillor Myatt just said, and it was another thing that was on my mind, was uh, uh, this is a, a, a fairly dry financial report with a, with a, a nearly 1% tax increase in it. And it's important, I think, to be real clear that we, we took this money and directly applied it to the tax levy in 2015. Uh, so this is this will and has oh, it has always been applied. So by removing it, it will put a, a 0.84 percent hole in the in the in the operating budget in 2016. Something we should be prepared for. But that but it is the right thing to do, and it's the right. This is the right way to deal with it, rather than at the fine, at the at budget to make sure that 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 staff is prepared. Staff, the, the budget we get presented by staff works that in and, and takes it into account. I think this is a better approach than the one we took in 2015 where we, where we debated whether or not to do that, which is, I, in my view, probably not as good a management as this is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll see if it survives the budget next spring. <laughs> 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 so uh, of the understanding of how we are now, what do you want me to describe? I think, what, is everybody clear, I think, what we're doing here? Okay? Okay. All in favor of the, the recommendation is thank you very much. And the last one is the debt management policy and Kate again. All right, so the final sort of component of these borrowing and, and funding strategies is our debt management policy. When we don't have funds in hand, either through reserves or in cash, we may choose to issue debt. That plays a very important role to the town's financing structure and provides a strong indicator, like reserves, of our overall financial health. The town has utilized debt financing as a vehicle for funding capital projects since its inception. However, again, like the reserves, there has not been a formal policy adopted by resolution to govern the administration of these instruments. There is a benefit to having the single policy. Currently, mandated limit on the, the mandated limit on the amount of debt that we are able to accumulate is governed by our annual repayment limit. Attached to this report is the 2015 annual repayment limit document. This same document was provided to Council when it was received. However, I've included again with this report as, as it is relevant to this discussion. As noted in the document, the total annual repayment limit for 2015 is set at $4.5 million. This doesn't re represent how much debt we can have in principle, but rather it is how much our debt payments can be on our existing debt, so principal and interest. This is calculated as 25% of our 2013 own source revenue. So there's a two-year lag based on our most recent completed year end. Since 2014 is not complete when they issued the 2015, they used the 2015. Own source revenue is basically our total revenues, removing any amounts that are generated from grants and balance sheet adjustments, PSAB adjustments, and other non-cash related transactions, such as gains and losses. The document also shows that the available repayment limit, less current principal, so the actual payments that we're making on our internal debt, is about $3.8 million. To give Council an idea of how much available debt room the ARL allows for, at a conservative rate of interest of 5%, approximately $30 million of new external debt could be issued today and we could still remain under our ARL limit. A few points to keep in mind regarding the ARL. Internal debt, so amounts that we borrow from ourselves, although we do have those payments going back to the reserves, 
it does not impact the ARL. They're only looking at external debt. Source of funding is not considered. So the ARL doesn't care if our debt is being repaid from the water rates or from the tax levy. The current ARL is based on the most recently completed FIR, as I said. And as tax revenues and user fees increase, so will the ARL. So we'll see that number climb over time, as well as we pay off existing debt, that available room will grow over time. Also included with this, I've included um, a sort of tool that I've sort of been working on, a debt management tool. Um, it's included as a hard copy appendix to this report, and it's been developed for demonstration purposes. The hard copy is obviously static, but there is an Excel version which allows for council to make changes to anticipated projects, timing, other sources of funding, and just to see what those changes, what impact they will have on our ARL, as well as the self-imposed limit that I'll discuss in the policy next, and on our overall tax rate. Note that this tool is for demonstration purposes. The anticipated projects, estimated costs, and funding sources are merely rough estimates and would need to be refined before we rely on the tool for any financial planning purposes. However, I think you will find that is useful at budget time as you're looking at planning your long-term larger capital projects and, and determining what the impact of those will be on the overall tax levy. So the first section of that tool just allows the user to enter projects, the year of completion, and the estimated total cost. The second section shows the impact of timing and total debentured amounts determined in Section 1 on the ARL or self-imposed limitations and the estimated impact on the average taxpayer. One thing it is important to keep in mind is that the tool only considers the impact of principal and interest payments and it doesn't consider other operating cost fluctuations associated with the final section depicts the annual payments associated with existing and proposed new debt. So that might be useful for Council now just to see what we are paying on at this very moment and based on the information that goes into the first section, what those anticipated future payments will be. It is the intention of staff that as Council refines their priorities as a result of the recent visioning session, detailed cost estimates, and alternate funding sources for the projects Council has selected as priorities in this term can be analyzed in greater detail and entered into the tool. The electronic version will be provided to any one of you that are interested in using it. And then finally, I'll just talk a little bit about the debt management policy that is attached. The purpose of the policy is to ensure that the funding decisions are made in a consistent manner and that there is some direction in determining the reasonability and the structure of debt that's issued. By setting thresholds and terms, it allows for transparency in evaluating the true cost of projects and allocating those costs back to the departments and the programs that they relate to. The other aspect of the policy is to set limitations on the total amount of debt that can be issued by the municipality. Without the existence of the formal policy, the only formal limit that we had in the past is the ARL. The proposed policy provides additional, more strict limitation that reduces the available, by 20, the available debt room by 25% as a contingency or safety net, um, and then allocates 30% of the total debt room to rate-funded divisions only. In addition to restrict, restricting available debt room, the self-imposed limitation will consider both internal and external debt payments when looking at what our total um, allowable payments could be. So based on the recommended policy, the debt room available to the municipality in 2015 is identified in that pie chart. The available tax-funded debt available is in the purple, and uh, the available rate-funded debt is in the red. Based on the information from the debt management tool and the available room as noted in the chart, using a conservative interest rate of 5%, our total room for new debt today would be just over $3 million for those rate-funded departments and $18 million for the tax funded. This is a very conservative estimate um, and actually I did mean to include in my report the uh, lending rates that we do have available to us from Infrastructure Ontario are very favorable. Give you a quick idea, a 20-year amortizing debenture right now, the rate that we would get on that is 
3.09%. And, and to address your comment from earlier, Councillor Carbonell, I think in combination with the reserve policy and the investment policy, this is our safety net in those events that if we do have funds tied up in reserves, we do have these favorable rates available to us from the province that we could take advantage of in the event that we did not have cash Financial impact, there is no financial impact to the adoption of the debt management policy. Future principal and interest payments will be limited by not only the ARL, but also to self-imposed limitations on the amount of the principal. And then I've included the ARL the documents once again, a hard copy of the tool, and the draft debt management policy that I'm presenting. Thank you, Kate. Uh, then the recommendation is that Council adopts the debt management policy. Comments? Questions for Kate? Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you. Um, another um, great direction and, and good to have it all sort of put together in one package. I'm just curious, Kate, um, if you could make a comment. It, it's always um, been a little confusing to me, but also um, it makes sense in, in, in one way too. When we um, debt finance something, um, so I'll use the Dr. Earl Medical Clinic as, as an, an example. We made a decision to debt finance that over a period of time. I believe it was 20 years. So in that first year when we made the decision, it doesn't actually sort of show up in the budget really. But then after that point, even though it's a capital investment, after that point it seems to, to come back as part of the operating budget. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because it is a capital expenditure. Could you could you just make a comment about how we how we process debt into the budget process? And um, Sue, I'll, I'll ask you this in, in the fall, so we have to remember the answer. Thank you. Certainly, you are correct. Although we budget for the actual capital expenditure in the capital fund, the payments come out of the operating fund in future years as principal and interest. Um, one of the benefits of that is it does allow us to reflect the cost of those projects within the departments that are ultimately responsible for funding them. Um, but it is, it's mostly a, an accounting treatment that we consider probably not the best answer but it's just sort of the, the way we do it <laughs> um, I, I get that interest could be an operating expense but principal is for the capital project so why why is it why does it become an opera the reason why I ask is that it's always kind of amuse me that sometimes we make decisions and then um, it just adds more to the operating budget when really we've built something so uh, thank you for the answer. I'll, I'll, Sue, you're on notice. <laughs> okay. Councillor Dave Mayette. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, just a quick question, Kate. Um, just looking at your pie chart there and trying to understand the difference between the rate-funded and the uh, tax-funded borrowing room, the rate-funded would be things like putting in a sewer line, right, or water line, water system, right? Correct. I've included water, wastewater, and now landfill expansion. We do have the new landfill rate. So, so based on that uh, borrowing room of three million one sixty-eight, we wouldn't be able to afford without some sort of external help to do, say, the Goebbels Grove project. That's three million. Correct. Keeping in mind that there is existing debt within those departments that will be falling off. So that room will grow over time as we pay off our existing debt. That's just a point in time at the end of 2014 were the numbers that I used, mm -hmm. but it will grow over time. You're absolutely right, though. It is far more restricted, and perhaps that is one of the things that Council may want to adjust in the future is, is those allocations if we determine that it is not sufficient to operate those departments. Thank you. Just as a sort of continuation of that thought, did we not make a decision when we did the um, project north of the river in Southampton that there were some aspects of the project that were 
um, beyond the ratepayers in that area. So there was some taxpayer um, across the community input into that. So there would be potential in a in a big infrastructure project to assume that it sometimes goes beyond the actual users um, in that immediate area. It, it, would that be correct? Yeah, and, and that project north of the river, uh, only the sewer portion and any upgrades to the water were paid by the uh, residents. So any of those improvements that were done to the roads, and there were substantial roads, sidewalks, stormwater management, was funded from the general levy. And, and I suspect that, you know, I mean, that's the way that one was done. <laughs> Go ahead. But it's important to note, Mr. Mayor, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but, it, but that tax levy funded portion was not debt financed. It was, it was funded from the, from the capital fund in the year that it happened. We spent a million dollars out of the capital, out of, the, of capital expenditure in one year north of the river to pay for that portion. So, so just to clarify with regard to this report, with regard to debt financing and the breakdown between uh, the capital funded, uh, um, the, pardon me, the rate funded, uh, area and the and the and the levy funded area. Uh, uh, I think that there's a track record, at least, of separating of separating those things in the past. I mean, we, we've kept we have kept clearly we've clearly delineated and kept them separate, even in terms of our borrowing. Um, so I don't think that there's a deviation here. If I maybe I hope I'm not putting words in the vice deputy mayor's mouth, but I, but I don't I don't I, I don't think there's any deviation from past practice to today in terms of what. The administration is proposing with regard to how we would structure debt financing uh, and how this pie is sort of broken down. So uh, I think it is clearly reflective and that that's a good example of a project with that did reflect that would have worked under this policy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any further questions? Just before I call the vote, I, I, I think this is some outstanding work, Kate, and I really appreciate the work that you put into these policies and uh, they, they will give us a lot of guidance and information as we all move forward. So thank you for that. So I'll call the question then. All in favor? Opposed, if any. That's carried. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a, uh, a staff report, a planning and development staff report, and it has to do with uh, Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority zoning comments, and our uh, Bart Toby will present. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The attached letter from SVCA requests comments on the current practices of including zoning opinions when SVCA receives permit requests and general inquiries. Saugeen Shore Zoning Bylaw designates the Chief Building Official as a Zoning Administrator. The CBO has access to County Planners, Town Development Coordinator, Municipal Staff and the SVC, SVCA determining appropriate zoning regulations. There is no suggestion that the SVCA make any changes to their core activities. However, there is a potential for conflict between the advice given by the SVCA and the Town regarding administration of zoning. This will not change how or when landowners will need to consult with the SVCA. It does appear that the SVCA is looking to avoid creating conflicting opinions. And, both, and for this, the, sound, the staff supports the discontinuation of SVCA providing zoning commentary in their consultant, consultation letters. Thank you, Bart. Then the recommendation is that Council recommends the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority discontinue providing zoning comments in their correspondence, except as pursuant to the existing planning services agreement with the County of Bruce, and except upon the direct request of the town's chief building official. Comments, questions? Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just some uh, very brief uh, uh, context to this. Uh, the Conservation Authority uh, Board of Directors and staff is in the process of uh, reviewing its uh, planning activities uh, its, uh, and its regulations uh, department uh, with the intention of uh, simplifying the process and improving the functionality of the planning department of the Conservation Authority, recognizing, I think, that uh, the authority, uh, what this recognizes is that the authority has, uh, uh, we believe, uh, good staff and an important uh, regulation that needs to be enforced, uh, but that there are processes in place uh, that um, add more work uh, and, and, and muddle the process uh, at the Conservation Authority. And uh, what we're attempting to do is sort of uh, eliminate some of those things that our planning and regulation staff don't need to be doing or that our partners in the municipalities don't require us to be doing uh, so that we can focus on the core things that we ought to be doing and do those things better. 
so, um, so I think that this is good direction. I hope uh, Council uh, supports it, and uh, and um, certainly once we once the authority has heard back from all of its member municipalities, we'll be making some decisions about uh, whether or not we'll be uh, uh, continuing with this practice or not. And it's also important to note that although. Bart's uh, report uh, states that this has, doesn't relate to the planning services agreements with uh, the County of Bruce, and he's quite correct with regard to this correspondence. Uh, it's important to note, and for Council's information, uh, that the Conservation Authority is currently in discussions with uh, the Warden and CAO of Bruce County um, on reviewing that memorandum of agreement and also looking at ways that we can streamline our commenting with regard to uh, with regard to that aspect of zoning comments from the county between the county and uh, and the conservation authority and that will have also a direct effect i hope on streamlining the process and making it better and making it in the end an easier process for people looking to develop in the town of Sogging shores thank you Mr. Mayor. thank you vice deputy mayor huber thank you um i don't know who who would be best able to answer this but this is a great idea. Um, the, the little bit of time that I sat on the SVCA uh, board, we finally got around to, to making the letters that, that they sent out to people a little sim more simplistic and that it said in the first paragraph what their actual reply was and then some of this other information was there that was confusing. I'm just curious now and perhaps um, the deputy mayor, um, who uh, I believe is the chair of the SVCA, um, Perhaps you can answer this. What does this actually mean for somebody who um, is going through a process? Because if they have hazard land on their property, let's say, so they come in to Sogging Shores, they apply for a building permit. The way they used to work was they had to actually, actually also at the same time be going to the Conservation Authority for some kind of permit too. Is this going to take away that step? No, the, all that this, this particular, and it's important to note, this is happening in the context of a much broader review of the entire process, hoping to make it better. But this specifically deals with, and I can, it might be best to illustrate it through a concrete example. Uh, I had a, a situation uh, in the last couple of months where uh, somebody was looking to uh, um, put an addition on their home, uh, and uh, um, they made the application through the building department of the town, Conservation Authority is also involved because it was in hazard land, um, but the Conservation Authority provided comments back that would, weren't part of our memorandum of agreement with Bruce County, just unsolicited comments about the zoning that, um, uh, that contradicted the opinion of our own planning department and, and staff at the County of Bruce, who, are, who have direct responsibility for the zoning, uh, for, imp for enforcing the zoning bylaws. So that contradiction, um, created confusion, and confusion is bad when you want to have a good process that leads to good development in the community and happens in a good and, and expedient way. So uh, this hopefully will prevent at least at some level some of that unnecessary or unsolicited contradiction between the regulatory agencies and hopefully uh, in some small way that will make the process better. Okay, any further comments? All in favor? Opposed to Finney, that's carried. Uh, the next item on the agenda is communications petitions for community full information. There's nine items there. Most of them are minutes, they're reports. Uh, one about the Conservation Authority, about new online mapping, and perhaps maybe the Deputy Mayor would like to speak to that. I would again briefly, Mr. Mayor. The SVCA uh, mapping is now online. I, I wore my SVCA pin tonight because I'm particularly proud of this, and uh, it's, a, I think, a great way uh, for... Uh, the Conservation Authority to clarify uh, in a really clear way to everybody in the public and to municipal uh, officials where their area of interest is and where it is not. Uh, and uh, this, uh, it makes it pretty simple. If, if uh, you're inside one of the shaded areas on one of these maps, uh, you probably, uh, well, you do need to go to the Conservation Authority. If you're outside one of those areas, you probably don't need a permit from the Conservation Authority, and I think that that alone is a, is a, is, uh, a great way to make this sim more simple and easier for people, which is what people want. But I, the reason I wanted to comment on it, Mr. Mayor, is because I think that there's an opportunity, and I would encourage all members of council to go look at this mapping for Saugeen Shores. I think there are opportunities. If you look uh, 
north of the river in Southampton, if you look on the north end of Port Elgin, if you look on the south end of Port Elgin, there are two different types of mapping the Conservation Authority has. It has regulation quality mapping and it has a less accurate hazard land mapping. And that hazard land mapping is the mapping that requires the 50 meter buffer. Uh, we only have good quality regulation mapping for our urban settlement areas. Uh, and so, but the areas where we're developing most, north of the river in Southampton where we put in sewers, north, of Port El north end of Port Elgin, down uh, below the ridge where there's a huge amount of development happening, those areas have the less accurate hazard land mapping and the additional 50 meter buffer zone. Uh, that, uh, that puts a whole bunch of land in play for the Conservation Authority to regulate that they don't actually regulate. It makes a whole bunch of paperwork for a lot of people trying to build in the community. And I think the opportunity for the town of Saugeen Shores is for us to engage in a dialogue with the Conservation Authority as to how we develop the more accurate regulation quality mapping in those specific areas. And if we can do that, uh, we will make it massively more easy for our high development areas to develop in the future. So I wanted to put that out on the table. Uh, there's going to be communication coming from the Conservation Authority inviting that communication with all of our water municipalities uh, and uh, I want council, this council to be aware of it uh, right away so that you're aware that uh, it's something we should be working on uh, ASAP. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments to any of those? If not, then we have uh, the next uh, report of department heads and we have three information reports. The first is to do with beach sampling. Second, Soggy Shores, two th perhaps I don't, uh, I'll go through them all. And if, uh, do you want to speak to them all? Any of them? No? But we will have some, okay, we'll, uh, we'll take the first one, beach sampling. Is anybody any comments or questions to beach sampling? Vice Deputy Mayor Hewer. Um, really, it's, it's more for the, the benefit of, of um, the recently elected councillors. This is like a full circle change from a couple years ago when they stopped sampling altogether. So this is great. Thank you, Stuart. Whatever you, you did in all of this, um, this is much appreciated. This, yeah, this was, uh, you're right, it was a provincial policy that stopped it. It's, it's the Great Bruce Health Unit that pro does this sampling, and they changed the policy, and so they discontinued it, and, uh, and there was a number of people that gave input to them, thankfully, and uh, the province then has changed the protocols and the sampling, so there, we will be sampling more often, and I think there's a new, new protocol out also. But there, I know there's a new protocol out uh, but one of the things, and we discuss this often about at that, the, uh, the health unit, and, and I think the, go, check the website. One of the best things you can do is be informed yourself about when conditions are likely to be unsafe. They're not all that hard to recognize in the water. It's after storm events, cloudy water, that type of thing, because if you rely simply on sampling, um, not all beaches are sampled, and samples have turnaround times of two days. So there's issues around that. But I, I would say the best thing that we can tell people is be informed about what are the issues that often lead to poor water quality. Did you want to speak to it, Stuart? Yeah, very briefly. There's also signage that these will put some increased signage where we are going to do more sampling as well that, that speak directly what the mayor was talking about, the, the symptoms of cloudy water, storms the day before, those type of environmental conditions that you can look for prior to swimming. Now, this will increase the amount of sampling, increase the areas. So last year we did have two beach postings. Um, it will give more information to users and the municipality when that happens next time. And we, we do have to, the health unit has been extremely flexible with this. They, they noticed that we had some issues with the beach, po beach postings last year. They met with uh, myself and Jane on site and we developed this over the winter and they were, they were extremely flexible in, in dealing with this with us. One final, I don't want to spend a lot of time on one final, we have a long history of characterizing the water quality along the beaches here in our community and it is very good. Some of the best in the Great Lakes. So it's not, it's not an issue, it's just a, uh, that we should be all informed about it. So there's another item there, it's uh, information report about Soggy Shores 2014 waste diversion and uh, Vice, or sorry, Councillor Mike Myatt. Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a, a couple comments and then uh, a question too uh, about Bowser and I, a comment I guess is uh, is uh, hats off to our community where you know, with waste diversion rate of 49 percent be nice to get that up into the 55 to 60 percent one day but that, that obviously comes with a cost and uh, 
but uh, congrats to uh, everyone involved with keeping materials out of our landfill site. But it may be a question to, to our Director of Public Works or maybe to Councillor Rich, perhaps. Um, the uh, items, as we add items to our, uh, to our blue box, uh, that, that obviously comes with a cost. I get asked uh, a few times uh, on occasion about plastic-coated um, milk containers, plastic-coated uh, orange juice containers. Uh, is, that, is that an allowable product, I guess, is the thing, is, is the question. I, I don't believe it is. If, at least if it is, I'm not putting it in my loot box. I should be. Um, the, other, the other point I wanted to question, I guess request maybe, and, and Councillor Shildroth always did a really good job with uh, once every year or two. Uh, came forth with a little table of goodies in front of the table here and said, here's what you can put in your blue box and here's what you cannot put in. And I, I kind of always enjoyed that session watching that. So so maybe uh, maybe maybe our Councillor Rich could, 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 could do that. But my question is, uh, as we add items, it, it, it does, it's not free, obviously. It comes with a cost. And so to add an item like plastic-coated milk, orange juice, for example, I don't think it's included. If we were to... How, how do we, how, do, how does it calculate in terms of what additional costs that adds to that service? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so as far as I understand, uh, many plastic coated or Tetra Packs um, have um, a number of different products inside of them. So it's about volume. Um, so they have to be able to separate it into the individual coatings that are inside of that at the processing center. And when they do that, um, it reduces the volume. So we don't have enough Tetra Packs or enough um, milk containers in order to make it worthwhile, and there's not a lot of money in it. Um, we may not know, but uh, we actually take a loss on glass. So any glass that we ship out, um, we have to pay somebody to take it. <clears throat> the only things that we do make money on are plastic and uh, tin cans. Currently, we're looking at a 2.5% 2, 2 increase in the cost per household, and or, or was uh, suggested by... Um, the director of Basra, and uh, that was turned down by the board of directors at that point. So if we want to take additional products, we can recycle everything, but it's going to cost a lot more money as we move across the board. Mr. Mayor, so garbage in two weeks, you're going to be... Yes. Yeah. Right Councillor Dave Mayette. I would move that we uh, have a motion to, or pass a motion that we go past 10 o'clock. Okay. And I'll second it for that. Vice Deputy Huber, all in favour. Okay, and Vice Deputy R. Huber. Just a comment that sort of sounded like Fred there. You know, you can have it all, but it's going to cost you. He used to say that all the time. Anyway, um, I'm assuming, Stuart, on your list here that um, cardboard fits in under wood products because um, cardboard wasn't specifically mentioned. Oh, yes, it's wood products. Uh, top line, Basra collected items. Would be okay, so Basra collects the cardboard for us. Um, the question I get, get asked a lot is um, light bulbs. Now, you've got fluorescent bulbs here, and, you know, I've taken some out to the landfill myself. Um, those nice new um, LED squiggle lights, you know, is there a place where people can take those? Because, you know, there, there's mercury in them, and, you know, and, and if it becomes too complicated, I know they're just going in, into the garbage bag. Do we – is there any process that's better – for disposing of those new light bulbs? Are you referring to the light bulbs that spiral somewhat? Those are not LED. Those are also fluorescent lights or some, some other, they're not LED and we do accept those with this recycling program here and they get shipped down to a company in Kitchener. So um, the only way to dispose of them properly is to physically take them to the landfill? I understand there might be some other drop-off locations, private, commercial ones. For the municipality, that's where we collect them, yes. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, remind Stuart that if we have composters and green waste bins and everything sitting in storage, that please come, come bring us the numbers, and if we need a reduction to get a few more out there in the community, I'm sure you'll get some support from Council. Thank you. Okay, there's one more information report. It has to do with second council visioning session. Any comments to it? I think it's just information that we will see more of it. So, if nothing else, then I'll take a motion to adjourn. Don and Luke, all in favor, adjourn. We'll be back here in 10 minutes.